All right, good morning everybody and welcome to the June 20th, 2019 budget hearings for the Santa Cruz County. Uh, we are going to today focus on public safety and justice and we have a presentation on those categories as provided in the proposed budget on pages 317 through 319 and outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. And Ms. Mowry, do you wanna give us a quick overview? Yes, please, good morning, uh, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. Um, Christina Mowry, the County Budget Manager. I'm gonna give you a brief overview View of the Public Safety and Justice Departments and their budgets. Um, so public Safety and Justice uh, consists of the 911 Communication Center, Animal Control, the Contribution to Superior Court, County Fire Protection, District Attorney, Emergency Services, Grand Jury, Probation, Public Defender, and of course the Sheriff Coroner. The total expenditures for Public Safety and Justice are uh, $158 million. Um, this represents about 19% of the total county budgeted expenditures for fiscal year 1920 and is a 5% increase from the previous fiscal year, which is primarily the increase to cost to maintain current operations. This chart shows you the breakdown by each agency and as you can see the sheriff coroner represents about 54% of that. Here you'll see the um, expenditures for the next two years broken down by um, type, um, salaries and benefits being the largest expenditure um, of over $100 million, um, and then uh, which supports over 588 positions, uh, which includes an increase of nine and a half positions over the previous fiscal year, some of which your board has already added mid-year. Additional expenditures include services and supplies of 51 million and other charges of 6 million and of course a small amount for contingencies which shows up in our county fire budget. Status quo increases are estimated for fiscal year 2021 and reflect an increase of about $7 million or a 4.5% increase over fiscal year 1920 and we'll update those for you in the following year. The revenues for public safety and justice consist of about $66 million or 42% of the total financing with the general fund and other funds making up the difference of 58% uh, to support the expenditures. Public safety and justice revenues represent 8% of the total budgeted revenues um, in the county and this chart uh, shows the share of financing by department and agency. And note both that the animal services and the grand jury are not represented as they are totally supported by the general fund. Here you'll see a breakdown of the next two years of the revenues um, by type. Um, the largest uh, this, uh, type uh, is $45 million in intergovernmental re revenues, which is state and federal funding, 11 million for charges for services, 7 million in taxes, fines and assessments, and about three million in licenses and other financing. Additional financing includes about 89 uh, million in general fund support and two million in other funds. Fiscal year 2021 revenues are estimated are relatively status quo at this time and will be updated when more information is available. So here you'll see a breakdown of the general fund contribution uh, by department and agency. Um, for a total of $90 million, which represents 54% uh, of the total general fund net cost, and further details are provided in each department budget proposal. Sure, so the, the total general fund support for public safety is $90 million, yeah. and it represents 54% of the total general fund net county cost. And there you'll see the sheriff corner represents 60% of the public safety contribution. And of course, the Public Safety and Justice Departments uh, contributed 23 objectives for the 1921 operational plan. Major projects include completion of the first year of the Focused Intervention Team pilot program, a feasibility study to apply restorative justice principles through a neighborhood court system, the completion of an accredited DNA lab, and a target to reduce recidivism among AB 109 clients by 15% over two years. The county works continuously, internally, and with our community partners to promote safety, reduce recidivism, and foster shared safety and opportunity. 
The opening of the Aptos Service Center and Probation Service Center bring new capacity online in service to the community in the form of better to community access and more efficient service delivery. Events such as the Human Trafficking Symposium, the Forum on Restorative Justice, have shown light on important public safety issues. While bodies such as the Community Corrections Partnership and Task Force on Justice and Gender continue to work to transform these issues into policies and practices. From improving our emergency operations to serving as first responders, from finding homes to offering low cost or free spay neuter and vaccine services for pets, from representing nearly 10,000 cases of the public defender and continuing to serve the needs of the AB 109 population, the public safety and justice departments serve and protect the citizens of Santa Cruz County. The largest of the public safety and justice departments will provide um, presentations on the regular agenda today. Status quo budget proposals are included on the consent agenda and include the 911 communication center, animal <coughs> control services, the contribution to Superior Court, County Fire Protection. Christina, sorry, we're just going to pause for a moment. Um, community oh. TV is not getting our feed, oh. and so we're just going to give it a moment to, oh, to get, up, get us online. Okay. That was the practice run. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> oh, I get a do over? No. <laughs> yeah. Are we, are we we're good? Okay. Feel free to right. continue from where you were. From where I was. Okay, yeah. so the status quo budget proposals are included on the consent agenda today. Uh, include 911 communications, animal control, contribution to superior court, emergency services, grand jury, and the public defender. Department heads are available today to answer any questions. Um, available for any questions. Sorry, to bring on, I'll bring it back to the board to move on to item number 45, which is action on the consent agenda. These are items 50 through 55 on today's agenda. Uh, first, I'll ask if there are any questions from board members around these items. Yeah, I just wanted to, and a very important uh, and ever-changing, it appears now, 9-11 uh, Communications Center. I think it's a relief to see that Governor Newsom is proposing uh, a budget that includes replacement of, um, a replacement of a funding mechanism for the 9-11 system. Um, the, the county general fund of contributions so shows that, uh, an increase of 641,000 from the prior years, more than 76% increase as people move using cell phones. Um, governor Brown tried to s fix this situation and now Governor Newsom is, in essence, would uh, implement a, what, 30, 43 cent per month charge on mm -hmm. cell phones to pay for this system. Is that what, where we're going? Yes, uh, the, the governor's um, proposal will help uh, the 911 system. However, it's mostly for capital improvements to the system, and it's not for ongoing operations. So the ongoing operations have increased by um, about $600,000 in our 911 center this year. Uh, governor Newsom's proposal won't help that, but it will help in terms of making the system work better and give us more money for capital items. Um, the costs are going up uh, primarily due to a records management system consolidation that we are now participating in. So every public safety um, jurisdiction or every uh, law enforcement agency with the exception of Scotts Valley will now be part of the same records management system and it'll be much more effective as well. And then the other is just uh, the rising costs of our calls for service. The number of calls have gone up in the, in the unincorporated area. So the combination of those two uh, have risen, have caused the cost to go up. And then our revenue source, our own county 911 fee, uh, the revenues have been going down because it's, it's reliant on landlines and not on cell phones. Right. And so that our own uh, revenue source has been uh, declining over time. Okay. Um, uh, secondly, on um emergency services, I, I just want to uh, say thank you to Rosemary Anderson and her team for their hard work. Uh, we've had uh, several meetings up in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley in particular. Uh, she has uh, made presentations about preparation and reaction should a uh, catastrophic, 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 
my, that's easy, it's early. Uh, <laughs> fire, fire, earthquake, or whatever the case may be, uh, and it's uh, particularly of uh, concern to people in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley where there's not too much uh, ability to go in and come out. Um, and uh, one thing is, just to prepare yourself as the, the word has gone out uh, with uh, food and clothing, water, as much, much as you can. And even when you're going over to work on Highway 17, uh, have a, a day or two of water or some uh, um, items that uh, could help you uh, withstand maybe one or two days uh, over the hill. So I, um, I just want to thank her for giving people that preparation and um, or suggesting how to prepare well for that um, unlikely, I hope, occurrence. But uh, it's really very important that we, uh, we can't tell people exactly where they should go and when a, a disaster occurs because we don't know where it's gonna be, where the fire might be, for instance, or something. So it's difficult to say this is where you should go uh, no matter what, um, but uh, she has been excellent at doing that, and one of the things that the fire agencies have said is that um, if you are told to get out, get out, because if you don't get out, they can't get in, or it makes it much more difficult for them to do that, to perform the work that they need to do, but uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate that and the, the uh, recent history we've had in California is quite frightening, but um, I think we're gonna be better prepared, but I er encourage people to uh, get be prepared for the unlikelihood uh, and of, uh, of a disaster, a fire, or earthquake, or something of that nature. Anything else, Supervisor Leopold? Uh, I just uh, wanna comment on uh, just two of the items on the consent agenda. First of all, our animal control services uh, very happy with the work that they do. Not only are they very effective out in the, in the field, uh, but they've really turned the animal shelter into a great uh, meeting space, c building community with people who care about animals. Uh, they've hosted some great events, and I'm looking forward to this next year in terms of expansion um, uh, to see that, w that work continue and grow uh, at the 7th Avenue site and the new uh, benefit uh, shop that's opened at 17th and Felt is also a great spot and uh, it's always cheery when I go in there and uh, I understand it's doing very well for the animal uh, uh, controls, uh, for the animal shelter and I just wanna uh, appreciate Melanie Sobel for her leadership in terms of making that all happen. It takes a lot of people um, uh, to make the animal shelter go and animal control services but it takes a great leader to build community and thank you for that. Uh, and also I just wanna uh, follow up on the Office of Emergency Services um, I went up to Sacramento along with Supervisor McPherson and uh, uh, Sheriff Hart and uh, Rosemary Anderson to the governor's uh, conference on emergency management services to hear f what other communities are doing around the state to prepare. And the one thing that I came away, on with, away with is there's still a lot we have to do, but, w but we, have, uh, we have a really good plan in place. Uh, we have really good efforts. Uh, to reach out to our rural uh, neighborhoods uh, and we have a commitment uh, to go out and do public education and uh, like my colleague uh, Ms. Anderson has, uh, has participated in some educational events up in uh, the summit area and it's been very useful information that has been shared and so I encourage everyone to sign up for the Code Red uh, and uh, be prepared for uh, the next disaster because here in Santa Cruz it will come. Okay, uh, now's the time for the public to speak to us about these items. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I would move the consent agenda. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We're now gonna move on to item number 46, which is to consider the 2019-2021 proposed budgets for county fire protection as outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the continuing agreements list and amendments to the unified fee schedule for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the CIO. Chief Larkin, welcome. Mr. Beaton, welcome back. Good morning, uh, Chair Coonerty, members of the board, Mr. Palacio, uh, Ian Larkin, um, Cal Fire, County Fire, Fire Chief, I'm here to uh, present to you, um, here, hold on, we got 
too many fingers, too, too many fingers on the buttons here. <clears throat> uh, I'm here to present to you um, our 2019 state of the state prior to uh, uh, entering into our uh, budget presentation. Um, I'm here uh, seated to my right with uh, General Services Director Michael Beaton. <clears throat> so kind of setting the stage for uh, what we're uh, up against here in California, as we're all too aware, um, last year in 2018, we experienced one of the most devastating fire seasons uh, in our history. Um, it continues to burn uh, larger and faster than we've ever seen uh, before. So as we look uh, into the future, uh, we're gonna discuss a few topics such as the new normal, uh, some items that are provided through predictive services that help uh, us look at our outlook and predict what uh, we have uh, in store for us in the future. Our state of the state, we'll cover um, some things about our water outlook uh, moving into fire season as well as our local impacts. In 2018, there were over 7,500 wildfires in the state of California that burned more than 1.8 million acres. That seems pretty extreme, but the staggering number here is that we lost over 22,700 structures were destroyed in those fires that burned 1.8 million acres. That continues to be a struggle throughout the wildland urban interface. <clears throat> so as we move to the new norm, what has changed? We've experienced the five hottest years on record in California. Temperatures continue to go up as we see climate change progress. We're seeing more extreme variations in our precipitation throughout the state of California as well. Our red flag events or our offshore wind events are becoming more extreme and more frequent. We have legacy infrastructure in the wildland urban face as well as our buildings in the wildland in urban interface are built with non wooey compliant construction due to their age. And our fire seasons are longer. On average, our fire seasons are one to two months longer than the norm. In addition, our vegetation and our fuels continue to change due to climate. So what I have here is just a, uh, a, about a one minute video. It's a progression time-lapse video of the campfire that occurred in Butte County last year. This fire burned approximately 90,000 acres in the first 24 hours. The campfire burned with such ferocity and speed that in the first 24 hours, first responders could not engage in firefighting activities, yet they had to concentrate specifically on evacuations and rescues of the public. And as you can see, that's just the first 24 hours um, as that goes. It's about a one minute video. That, st that stretch is basically from the town of Megalia um, to uh, Highway 99 in, near Chico. It's about, it's about 90,000 acres in the first 24 hours. <clears throat> so as you look at the impacts of the new norm, some of the impacts, um, firefighters are not able to effectively engage in initial attack operations uh, due to fire's intensity. They're burning hotter and faster than we've ever seen before. Due to fire intensity and how fast the fires are spreading, uh, there's cause for mass um, rescues and evacuations as well as casualties that occur with the fast moving fire. We're having to call for evacuations much earlier than we would have had in the past uh, to alert those um, residents much earlier in advance of those fast moving fires. We're also seeing large resource order requests uh, that are having to be uh, made in order to get enough resources into the area to combat these large fires. <clears throat> They're also being committed for longer periods of time due to the mass devastation. Um, fires continue to burn um, with extreme fire behavior, fire behavior that we haven't seen ever. Due to those mass evacuations, as was mentioned earlier in one of the presentations, um, traffic congestion becomes a, uh, a big condition that we have to deal with with our coordination efforts of trying to get resources in and trying to get people out of the area. The biggest part of this is the vulnerable populations that we have in our communities. They are most at risk during these times. So as you can see this graph, um, 
the average uh, acres that we're burning each year continues to rise every year. Our fires are getting larger and larger each year. <clears throat> As we look into the future and into the past, um, if we look at our mean acres burned, uh, our historical data shows us from 1961 to 1990 that we had moderate activity, and that would be your slide on the left. As we look into the future, um, predictions are showing uh, from 2070, I know this is way into the future, from 2070 to 2099, you can see the increases in activity statewide will be extreme. So as we look at our predictive services uh, outlooks here, um, as you can see in the slide on the uh, left-hand side um, is our snowpack from 2017. And I'm doing a comparison here over three years. So 2017 versus 2018 on the right, you can see there was a significant reduction in our snowpack. <clears throat> but if you look at 18 versus 19, um, in 2019, we have a significant snowpack. Um, still, in 2017, we had significant fires. So um, the additional snowpack will obviously provide for ample water and growth and vegetation uh, and supply us with water to fight fires, it does have other impacts with kill off um, from the snowpack. <clears throat> and I just show this picture just to kind of give you another re resonance of uh, what the snowpack looks like. Uh, the upper left hand is um, Half Dome in Yosemite in 2017 versus the right in 2018. And the lower uh, left is 2019 versus the lower right is the 2018 uh, comparison. So we do have a significant snowpack, which also creates additional issues with high water flooding when we're coming into the middle of June where we're talking about flooding. It's kind of crazy. <clears throat> so as we see um, over, over a period of time uh, in April, our average snowfall actually increased as well. We were about 165% of our normal snowfall uh, for that time frame. Precipitation, uh, as it started, uh, start of our rainy season to April, um, we were above average uh, for most of our areas. Even though we received uh, isolated periods of uh, rain, um, concentrated uh, rainfall, um, we still maintained an average to above average rainfall for our, our area. Um, late rains have uh, helped. As you can see, uh, we're well above um, our rainfall averages for the months of February to April. Um, we're about 90 to 110 percent of our above uh, average rainfall. <clears throat> but as we look at our fuel conditions, uh, the drought still remains. Um, though it is uh, lessening, it is not over. Uh, late rains made it uh, worse or better, depends on how you look at it. Late rains brought us more water, filled our reservoirs, but in turn, it actually created fuel for us. Um, the grass crop uh, is very plentiful, very tall. If you drive around the county, you can see there's areas where we have two to three foot grass, which allows for um, fires to burn rapidly uh, and move into the ladder fuels, uh, into our brush patches and things like that to carry fuel. <clears throat> As we look at our drought monitor, um, as you can see, the West Coast uh, in the month of April, uh, we're looking pretty good with the uh, exception of the far south portion of the state, which is abnormally dry. <clears throat> and then our seasonal outlook as we look into the future up to uh, July 31st of this year, uh, as you can see, um, the West Coast is kind of in that, um, uh, just a state of influx. We're, we're in good shape um, as the map uh, predicts, but um, the drought still remains, uh, and as we progress farther into the, the year, you'll see those uh, potential outlooks uh, change. Tree mortality, it's not a topic that we talk about greatly here uh, on the very west side of uh, the state of California, but it exists predominantly in the eastern side of the Sierras. But as you can see on this map, you're starting to see little speckles move west, and as that moves west, it's gonna become a concern of ours here locally as well. So as we look at our fuel moistures, um, this graph just kind of gives you a depiction of what our fuel moistures look um, for the last three years. Um, uh, and these are averages based over a 19-year period. But and if you look at 2018 versus 19, we're in a ver very similar trend. The 19 line is the blue and the 18 is the uh, orange. So um, we are already seeing a significant drop off of that just due to the uh, weather conditions we've had uh, of late. As we talk about our uh, energy release component, this is the amount of energy that a fire will give off. As you can see, um, once again, we're trending about the same as we were uh, in 2018. 
um, even though we had that significant amount of rain, our fuels did not absorb uh, as much moisture as we would have hoped, um, which is indicative of the uh, continued drought. <clears throat> so looking a little farther into the future um, with our potential outlooks, in the month of May, um, we were looking pretty good. We're about normal for our, our outlook for fire potential. <clears throat> As we move into June, as you can see, it'll increase um, throughout the uh, state of California, more in this, the valley as the temperatures rise there. <clears throat> but as we move into July, you can see our potential outlook here in Santa Cruz County increases to above normal. So as it was I mentioned earlier, we are not immune to wildfires here in the county. So our fire potential for April through May, uh, it's been about normal. Um, but as we move farther into the fire season, we will see as depicted in the uh, 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 slides here uh, that <clears throat> that potential is going to grow substantially and put us above normal. So as we look at the state of the state, um, CAL FIRE uh, in the last two years has moved to a new staffing model. Um, our staffing models used to be regionally based. Now they are statewide based and they've went to four levels of staffing. Uh, this provides for a more consistent um, staffing uh, level across the state, but it also provides for more available resources earlier in the fire season statewide. <clears throat> Our fuel reduction projects, um, we continue to uh, staff two state fire engines year-round that are committed solely to doing fuel reductions, uh, both in San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. Um, CAL FIRE has committed, um, they, in the governor's um, uh, release of the budget, had committed to adding 13 fire engines to uh, the state's um, already existing 343 engines. San Mateo Santa Cruz was a recipient of one of those engines, which we're very happy to increase our staffing to. Um, that engine will also be staffed year-round and be available in the winter months for fuel reduction. Also, I just wanted to mention in the governor's 45-day report, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, um, he identified 35 projects statewide that were a priority for the state um, to address. Um, fortunately for us, uh, one of those projects was here in Santa Cruz County. It happens to be in Supervisor's Friends District. Um, it'll be in the Aptos Creek um, Truck Trail and Buzzard Lagoon, uh, improving a fire break and fire road in that area. I just want to mention our Hollister Air Attack Base uh, came online uh, much earlier than normal this year. Um, it came online April 15th. Normally would not come online until June. Um, all aircraft are available on base uh, for response. One of the significant issues that we're seeing uh, this year is uh, we continue to see a reduced strength uh, uh, in our inmate crews. Um, with AB 109 and uh, some other issues within Department of Corrections, um, last year we were forced to reduce our crew strengths from five inmate crews at Ben Loman Camp to four. In recent, due to the inmate population being decreased again, we have dropped to three crews that are available. So we have a significant drawdown in our resource capability with our fire crews. But on a second flip side of that, the state has entered into agreements with the uh, California Conservation Corps to start to upstaff some firefighter hand crews. Um, and we have uh, listed here just the areas in the state where those crews are available. Um, there's two to, two to three crews in each of those camps that are available to us, and it appears that we may be moving in that direction into the future. And just a quick note on early staffing, um, just in comparison, last year um, we staffed engines May 15th. Uh, this year, um, even though we had late rains, we staffed engine here, engines here in Santa Cruz County and San Mateo on April 15th. So we were approximately a month ahead of schedule. Um, we went to peak last year um, on June 17th, and this year we'll go to peak on July 1st. So we had a little bit of a delay in going to peak just with some of those late rains and um, fire activity. Um, if you haven't heard, CAL FIRE has, um, uh, inter, uh, has been approved to purchase new helicopters. Uh, these new helicopters are a, a Sikorsky S-70I uh, Firehawk, which is basically a civilian version of a Black Hawk military version. Um, these helicopters will uh, increase our capacities and uh, ability to fight fire. Um, their water tanks uh, increased from the size of 370 gallons to over, th right at 1,000 gallons of water per load. So they'll increase our capabilities and carry a larger crew. Uh, we expect to see these on fires this summer as they are, uh, uh, there's a three-year three implementation phase. We spent most of the winter training our pilots uh, on these new ships that will eventually have night flying capabilities, which will be uh, a significant um, uh, increase to our capabilities here locally because a lot of our fires start at night here. <clears throat> also, um, CAL FIRE um, 
has a C-130 platform um, that we will be increasing and adding to our fleet of um, current air tankers that we have that are S-2s. Um, CAL FIRE um, has entered into an exclusive use contract for uh, one C-130 this year uh, to be utilized as a training platform. Um, the federal government uh, had seven C-130s that they were allocating to the U.S. Forest Service that they had a change in uh, heart and decided not to move forward with their program. Fortunately for us, we were able to secure those aircraft. Um, we're currently working through the contract agreements for the aircraft as well as training pilots and certifying these aircrafts to become air tankers. So as we look forward to our water outlook, um, with the late rains and the uh, late snowpack um, that we have and the runoff that we'll have with the late snowmelt, uh, we anticipate our reservoirs throughout the state of California uh, and here locally um, to be full and plentiful. Uh, but as we draw those reservoirs down, um, we still have those concerns about available water for fighter fighting capabilities in those remote areas of the county. Looking at our local impacts, um, our state and local crews will likely uh, see deployments uh, that will be most likely more frequently and for longer durations. As well, um, we continue to use our local government partners um, uh, statewide to augment the response to wildland fires um, throughout the state of California. And that concludes my state of the state. If you have any questions related to that, I'll be more than happy to take those now. Great. Are there any questions? Supervisor McPherson. Well, the, the um, yeah, the, this, as uh, Supervisor Leopold mentioned, this uh, the conference up in Sacramento was really telling uh, and uh, somewhat comforting in that the coordinated efforts and the teamwork that is going on between various agencies is is very much realized throughout the state of California. I think there was, what, 450 people at this conference? Um, and it's really something I, I'm, I'm really pleased with the county fire that uh, we've been able to, by the one sorely needed um, uh, replacement equipment for county fire, um, and I know that we're trying to, we're looking at some fuel breaks, um, a couple of them in San, uh, Scotts Valley along the Sims, uh, or the Lockwood Lane area, and then another one, that's about a mile long, and then another one about six miles that is much more difficult to reach, uh, but um, we, as we know, um, we're in fire season now, and it's longer, and it's more concerning for everybody, and um, I think they, um, we need to know, realize that county fire is, um, county fire is facing a structural deficit that uh, we're trying to address at this point, and uh, we'll probably get to that somewhat in more detail later, but uh, I'm just pleased to be working with the county administrative office, county fire, CAL FIRE, uh, the General Services Department and Emergency Services, um, this team effort to prepare us as well as we can be prepared is going to pay huge dividends, but it's it's um, comforting somewhat, it is comforting to see the state making such a uh, pronounced, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, commitment to trying to uh, prevent and uh, to prepare us for response too. So I thank you for your efforts and the coordinated efforts we've had with the various agencies throughout this county and throughout the state. Supervisor Caput, do you have any? Yeah, I want to thank you for all you do also. And, um, you know, whatever we can do, I, I support anything for, uh, you know, the fire department because uh, what you, 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 uh, you don't, you're not even close to two in, two out, right? Um, right now, our current staffing for CAL FIRE um, has three persons on every fire engine. So with the response of a chief officer uh, and other resources, we can, we can meet the two in, two out on the CAL FIRE side. The county fire side, it's a little different story because we only staff at two person staffing in the winter months. Sure, and then when it, when it comes to uh, uh, how does it work with the uh, Santa Cruz County fire? That's a patch. Uh, how, how many actually were the old uh, Santa Cruz County uh, fire patch? Well, all of our, all of our vol volunteers currently um, exhibit the you new patch on all, okay. our, on all of our personal protective equipment as well as the uniforms that they wear. So um, we, we've branded the fire department and then trying to uh, you know, get it out there for the public to have a better recognition of what the county fire department is. Um, they are, they're all uh, wearing that uh, patch. That has a long history and it's got a tradition to it. So, and then there's Cal Fire and then there's districts uh, uh, within our county. Uh, how, how does that separation work? I don't understand. 
Well, so, so CAL FIRE um, is responsible for all the wildland areas in the SRA, the state responsibility areas. Um, the county fire department has um, its jurisdiction as well as the uh, municipalities as well as the independent fire districts within the county. Yeah. Um, there is SRA within the independent fire districts and the SRA encompasses the vast majority of the county fire department as well. So uh, um, that relationship is uh, cooperative. Um, we all, they all operate within their independent jurisdictions and budgets. But when an incident occurs, um, it's, a, it's a, a mutual response to combat sure. that incident, no matter if it's a structure fire, or wildland fire, or any type of uh, significant incident. And then you have the overlap, I guess, with the cities, uh, City of Watsonville Fire, Santa Cruz Fire, uh, they'll they'll help out in an emergency and yeah that that takes communication and uh, quick uh, response. Yes, yeah, so our California mutual aid system is a very robust and strong uh, mutual aid system. Um, we also have auto aid agreements where we've uh, went ahead uh, ahead of time and have written actually documents that um, provide what services and how that's going to be uh, implemented uh, way before the incident ever occurs. So our coordination efforts are strong and well planned out here in this county. And I'm not sure if you'd be uh, familiar, but uh, then there's Pajaro Dunes. They have a special kind of a con contractual uh, fire department. Yeah, so um, the Pajaro Dunes CSA 4 is a uh, contract through Cal Fire through a cooperative fire protection agreement. You bet. Yeah, and I, I know some of the, the retired, uh, I believe they're all Cal Fire, uh, Greg Estrada. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, doing pretty good in retirement. And, uh, <laughs> and then I see uh, Rick Noble. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's, uh, he teaches my son, uh, uh, they have boxing uh, uh, for kids on, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, so Rick's doing that. Anyway, I want to thank you for everything you do, and I guess the last question I'd have, what, when there's a, a big fire, okay, uh, we had the Trabing fire, I call it that, back uh, a few years back. And then, of course, we all know about, or most of us know about, the big fire up in Butte County, uh, and then also Paradise and everything like that. Uh, the biggest tension builder, of course, might be the actual fire, but is it the evacuation? that you are wor most worry of, worried about? Because, uh, you know, I, there's so many different things going on when something's out of control like that. And uh, some of them are l less critical than others. You're absolutely correct. And life over property and environment is our number one priority. So evacuations is going to be our key factor. And as I mentioned in my presentation, um, we are seeing, we're having to uh, order these evacuations much earlier uh, based on the current conditions that we have and our history that we've seen on how fast fires are moving. Uh, our wind events are extremely, um, uh, wind is more um, uh, pronounced and at higher velocities, which is pushing those fires uh, more rapidly. So uh, evacuation is our number one key as, uh, you know, life, preservation of life is our number one priority. You bet. And I want to thank you and uh, may God bless all of you thank for you. everything you do. Mr. President Leopold. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think it's important for us to get this state of the state uh, uh, presentation to understand uh, the fire danger for this year because, you know, we wake up this morning, there's puddles on the ground. Uh, we think that's good. We walk, we go by Lexington Reservoir, see it's filled up, and we think that we're safe. But when we look at the information here about the danger we have, especially in the later part of the summer and early fall, um, it, we're, we're at risk. And uh, it's a good reminder for everyone to be prepared. Um, we, uh, I have a couple questions. Yesterday, the uh, Director of Public Works, uh, when he came uh, before us, talked about talking with PG&E about changing the way in which we do some of our underground of, uh, poles, uh, which we have historically done in the urban areas to improve view sheds. Uh, but he's looking into possibly doing it up in the in the mountains or the rural areas uh, on evacuation routes. And I wanted to get some sense from you is, um, will that help? Is that a good investment? Well, that, that's a good question. So um, undergrounding the power lines in an evacuation route doesn't eliminate the need for fuel reduction in those because you need to have a safe corridor 
uh, for people to traverse. And just by moving the power lines underground doesn't actually create um, solely a safe corridor. You still need to have that fuel reduction because when a fire does move through there, uh, it's gonna consume whatever's in its path. So sure. um, if we continue to have vegetation in those corridors, they wouldn't be safe for the public. So it does have some benefits because a lot of those corridors are where some of our fires start. So we do have uh, the benefit of that reduction um, the cost versus the cost ratio of it, if it's a you know cost prohibitive, um, is another question. Uh, that obviously underground epg e lines is very expensive. So yeah, um, yeah. but it, it could potentially have uh, some benefits, but I don't know if they outweigh the the reduction of the amount yeah, of fuel. Yeah, yeah, it's a use. it's a different budget to talk about of uh, uh, fuel reduction, um, and I know we're trying to build up our fire safe councils. Uh, to, uh, and I know uh, Chief Larkin, you participated in a meeting we had just uh, two weekends ago, I think it was two weekends ago, with uh, North Rodeo Gulch, uh, uh, a community that's concerned about fire at there in that wooey, I guess. Wild, ur wild, wild urban wild interface. Urban in uh, yeah, urban wild urban interface. Urban, yeah. um, <coughs> and they're concerned about fuel reduction. It looks like um, the Resource Conservation District, which is serving as our uh, Fire Safe Council will have some money to do some fuel reduction this year, which will be incredibly important, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop. That's something we have to do on a regular, ongoing basis. Yeah, the maintenance of that fuel reduction is the key, is once you do it, you have to continue to maintain it. Otherwise, obviously, it just grows back and becomes a fire hazard again, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, lastly, you talked about a, a, a project um, uh, in the Aptos Hills about creating fire breaks, which I think is incredibly important. Um, what kind of communication do you have with the CAL FIRE unit that represents Santa Clara County? Uh, because I know that there's an effort to do a fuel break in the summit area. It would mainly be on the Santa Clara County side. And I'm wondering if there's coordination and support uh, to make sure that that gets done as well. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have considerable co coordination with the Santa Clara unit as the uh, current unit chief there used to be my deputy chief. So we, we communicate very well, uh, even in the past. So uh, the units uh, border each other and communicate very well on those projects. And the one you're referencing is the uh, Highway 17 project uh, that'll basically do a fuel break from um, Redwood Estates to the, to the summit. Um, we coordinate those efforts. Um, a lot of our inmate crews will probably be assisting in that. Um, right that reduction of fuels there. Um, the goal is eventually to try to have that creep over into Santa Cruz County um, as we move forward and available funding comes uh, available to us. Yeah, well I know it's incredibly important for the summit area residents who are constantly talking to me about ways in which they can reduce uh, the fuel load and uh, some of them would like to return to what it was like 100 years ago when it was orchards instead of forests. Um, because of uh, the uh, extreme fire danger that's up there. So yeah. really appreciate the work, and I also appreciate that y you and your staff are available for public meetings to talk with the public, and of course I'm always impressed when, uh, how quickly you guys are on the scene when we have a fire uh, and are there to help people out. So thank, thank you. you for that. Um, and I just want to add my appreciation of thanks. We've had uh, residents from Bonnie Dune who've actually come up and they've asked us to enforce the code and cite them uh, uh, and their neighbors uh, because of the fear of, their, of what they've seen statewide and they see the trends. Um, and I really appreciate you going up there and meeting with them and working with them. I think yesterday in Parks we talked about how, <clears throat> you know, uh, the days of just sort of showing up and having government do everything uh, are, are behind us and people are coming together together to partner and I think uh, some of our rural neighborhoods uh, will be great partners in managing their own properties and hopefully in a way that's preventative and reduce risk for all of us down the road. Um, but I want to thank you for that, for, for meeting with them and, and doing outreach. Um, it, it might be a good opportunity to plug the CERT, you know, the, uh, uh, that uh, really our rural neighborhoods should, it should get CERT certified um, and uh, the community emergency response teams because that will help us out when when we can't get there, that the community is already there. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item. Is there anyone who'd like to come forward? Please line up. Good morning, supervisors, and thank you. 
Uh, and thank you to Chief Larkin and all of his staff. I'm really pleased to hear you talk about the partnerships that we enjoy within this community, which really means the difference between whether we're successful during or after an event is really about preparation and preparedness beforehand. And it's those partnerships within CAL FIRE, County FIRE, and also our district fire departments and law enforcement that have really worked with my office and training and exercising together, creating stronger community emergency response teams and creating a new CERT council. CAL FIRE uh, really participates very actively in that and having staff that participates on that council and helps with our advisory. The same with the Fire Safe Council, which is growing in strength in education and preparedness out in our community, which is gonna do great things for fuel reduction in the future. Highlighting Supervisor Coonerty, what we're looking at in terms of people being more resilient on their own and that it isn't that someone's gonna come in and save you, but more that we're educating people about how they can prepare and save themselves and through our community education efforts, which have been really actively involving law enforcement, fire, parks, and state parks and county parks about how we can educate the public on ways that they can do that. So I just wanted to thank Chief Larkin for his support and his staff support of the emergency operation services over the past four years that I've been in the job and, uh, and know that will continue to grow into the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. I'm confused. Are you going to hold a hearing on the budget itself too? Okay. Yeah, we still have, so. we still, yes, we still have the budget presentation okay. to continue. Please. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'll present you the uh, Santa Cruz County uh, fire protection budget for uh, fiscal year uh, 2019 through 2021. Um, I just want to point out a couple things here. In uh, 1948, the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors entered into a cooperative fire protection agreement with CAL FIRE, uh, or then known as the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, to provide structural fire protection services in the rural area of Santa Cruz County. Uh, this partnership uh, that it was um, created established the Santa Cruz County Fire Department and continues today. <coughs> the County Fire Department's mission is to protect life, property, natural resources, and its citizens and visitor, visitors through effective emergency response, preparedness, and education, as well as prevention. <clears throat> so a quick overview of the county fire protection. The county fire protection is comprised of, <clears throat> excuse me, the county fire department, um, which is CSA 48, as well as CSA 4, Pajaro Dunes. Um, separate funding for these two divisions of the county fire department required by law to have um, their own budget and may not use funds uh, between the two budgets or those two divisions to um, fund each other. The County Fire Department uh, budget is also uh, incorporates some contributions uh, to the Santa Cruz County um, Hazardous Materials Interagency um, team, which is better referenced as Schmidt, uh, and the Prop 172 pass-through funds, which are uh, utilized by the Santa Cruz County Fire Chiefs Association. The Santa Cruz County Fire Department is responsible for structure fire protection, uh, first responder medical services, technical rescues, vehicle accidents, hazardous materials response, public fire safety education, as well as fire marshal services, which also include the inspections uh, of properties in the unincorporated area for building construction. <clears throat> The county fire protection uh, responded last year to uh, 2,348 calls for uh, emergency response in the 2018 calendar year. 512 of those were fire related. We responded to 820 medical emergencies, 250 vehicle collision accidents, and uh, 766 other emergencies. And in those other emergencies uh, include responses to hazardous materials, um, hazardous condition, conditions such as power lines down, um, smoke checks, and as well as uh, other assistance uh, by, uh, requested by the public. So the County Fire Department um, provides services from 10 fire stations, are primarily uh, made up of volunteers that make up the bulk of our staffing for uh, CSA 48. The Cooperative Fire Protection Agreement that you have with CAL FIRE uh, provides supplemental staffing to those volunteer responders. 
And then our CSA 4 Pajaro Dunes uh, is staffed um, through a cooperative agreement um, that has paid staffing that also is supplemented by volunteer interns that help supplement our staffing there. So operational uh, support services um, include uh, the purchase and maintenance of fire apparatus, equipment, and safety gear. Um, we have oversight of fire station construction and maintenance projects. Um, we train and coordinate um, all the delivery of training to our volunteer firefighters. <clears throat> we provide emergency communications and uh, dispatch services. <clears throat> we provide supervision and administration to the volunteers um, as they encompass the vast majority of our staffing in the fire department. And then we also assist with the coordination of emergency response, uh, community emergency response team CERT um, in CSA 48. And then we pride ourselves on our coordination through um, Cal OES, but more importantly through our partner here in the county with our county uh, office of emergency services, uh, Rosemary Anderson. Uh, we have a great coordination uh, uh, through county fire as we are the uh, operation um, fire coordinator for the state, um, we work very closely with Rosemary on a lot of different uh, issues. So our main budget objectives, um, to maximize, thank you, mm -hmm. maximize the effectiveness of available fire funding, to maintain adequate staffing and equipment, vehicles and facilities to uh, effectively have emergency response, and then to sustain or improve the county fire uh, economic position and maintain our fire fund balance for future necessities. <clears throat> so some budget highlights from 2018. Um, our CAL FIRE Firefighter 1s, which are, are part of our supplemental contract, um, are funded fully by the state during the summer months and have, um, and during the declared fire season. And because our declared fire seasons are running much longer, uh, last year uh, started in mid-May and extended through December, uh, that equated to uh, uh, cost savings to the county fire department. <clears throat> um, last year, we were able to uh, purchase one water tender and one utility vehicle as part of our vehicle replacement program. Uh, in addition, um, we have one water tender um, that will be rebudgeted in our fiscal year 1920 budget. Uh, that was due to delays uh, in the manufacturer, dealing with the manufacturer's timelines as well as the specification for that apparatus. Also in 2018-19, um, we had budgeted equipment um, purchases for some sea land containers to improve our fire training ground as well as um, a medical oxygen cascade system that uh, required rebudgeting in the 1920 um, fiscal year due to uh, construction delays at our uh, regional training center up in Ben Loman. So in 19 through uh, 21 budget highlights, um, we have uh, proposed plans to uh, purchase uh, some new apparatus. Uh, we have uh, the replacement of one type one fire engine as well as one utility vehicle, very similar to the one that's uh, in the slide here, to replace um, some outdated and uh, aging um, rescue type vehicles that we currently have in our um, fleet. <clears throat> as well as uh, our 2020-2021 um, budget, uh, we also have a similar ask for uh, one type one engine and another uh, replacement rescue vehicle. Uh, the picture that you just showed, uh, that one fire truck, about how much does that cost? That, fi that, that fire engine runs um, approximately $600,000. How much? 600000 600000 brand new, okay. <clears throat> um, also in our budget, um, we have fixed assets um, that will equate to uh, the replacement of four uh, Jaws of Life uh, vehicle extrication tools for the county fire department and one additional uh, extrication um, tool for the CSA 4 Pajaro Dunes, as well as um, we'll be purchasing a uh, PPE or a personal protective equipment extractor. It's um, better known as, it's like a washing machine, but it's specifically designed for um, washing uh, firefighter protective equipment. This is all part of our um, uh, exposure risk reduction plan to limit the exposure our firefighters have to um, bad things that can cause cancer and other illnesses. Um, and then we also have uh, plans to replace um, 100 uh, SCBAs, our self-contained breathing apparatus, the uh, 
packs that our firefighters wear um, to enter structures in to protect their airway uh, to bring us up to the national fire protection standards. So looking at our budget, as we look at our revenues, um, the county fire protection revenues encompass uh, both the CSA 48 and CSA 4 Pajaro Dunes. Um, this also includes our pass-through accounts for the Prop 172 and Schmidt contributions. Um, our revenues in 2019-20 also include a 5% estimated increase in tax revenues, um, as well as a 3.9 uh, CSA fee increase based on the 2018 consumer price <coughs> index value. Um, as we look additionally into our revenues into 2020-21, uh, those are also based on an estimated 4% tax increase and then a CPI increase for the CSA fee of 3.2%. Um, our other funds, um, this is an um, amount of funds uh, that are allocated uh, that come from um, allocated to make up the difference between the revenues and the expenditures. Uh, these funds uh, in adopted 2019 were uh, elevated. Uh, this was due to an offset in um, non-liquidated contract um, funds during the fiscal year 17-18. So they look a little bit and appear a little bit elevated. Um, so as you look at our expenditures in the 18-19, our totals um, there show somewhat elevated due to that factor of those non-liquidated um, contract cost. Also in 2019-20, our expenditures include a one-time uh, purchase of um, $600,000 for our SC self-contained breathing apparatus. <clears throat> um, that uh, replacement is not included in the 2021 budget because it's a one-time expenditure. As we look at our revenue breakdown, um, our revenue breakdown includes our taxes, which are secured, unsecured property taxes, as well as uh, collected penalties. Um, our charges for services um, incorporate our uh, CSA fee, uh, fire marshal services, any cost recovery that we have, rent back of our county fire equipment to the state during the summer months, and then also our management services. Our intergovernmental revenues um, for the fiscal year 1920 um, are somewhat higher due to an anticipated grant that we'll be submitting uh, in hopes of um, replacing those funds for the SCBA uh, replacement. <clears throat> so as you look at our expenditure breakdown, uh, our services supplies uh, once again are elevated due to that non-liquidated um, accounting um, error that occurred. Uh, the cost for our water tender uh, was rebudgeted from the 1718 to the 1819 fiscal year. And then our services and supplies were reduced in the 2021 um, based on that uh, anticipated $600,000 uh, expense for our um, SCBAs. Uh, salary and benefits uh, reflect our volunteer firefighter stipend as well as our work and comp workers' compensation fees for the volunteers. <coughs> and then our other charges are those pass-through expenditures such as the Prop 172 to the County Fire Chiefs Association, Schmidt, um, our CSA 48 fund, uh, as well as our county management charges. Um, our fixed assets uh, are primarily our mobile equipment replacements uh, that we have. <clears throat> so our budget objectives, um, possible ballot measure is being considered um, to explore, uh, being explored um, for a new benefit assessment um, that would be supporting the restoration of county fire, firefighter staffing, uh, allowing us to have three person uh, personnel on our engines, also to uh, provide for um, allocation for station maintenance, and then also to fund our mobile equipment uh, replacement plan. Um, if we're successful, um, there could be a possible change in the CAL FIRE contract, um, which would add those additional firefighters back into that contract if we're successful, and also um, fund the mobile equipment replacement plan. So our intent to contract with CAL FIRE um, for fiscal year uh, 2020 through 2023. <clears throat> and uh, our current, going into our current year of 2019 through 2020 will be the final year of a current three-year contract with CAL FIRE. Um, CAL FIRE requires contracting agencies to formally notify the state at least one year in advance um, of their intention to contract. Uh, any changes in service um, level must be noted in that intent to contract. And then also uh, our staff recommends that the county uh, submit this notification um, for the fiscal years 2020 through 2023 by June 30th of 2019. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, at this point, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank a few folks. I wanted to thank Michael Beaton and his staff from General Services, as well as Tris Daniels, our um, county uh, analyst for the preparation of the budget, as well as Jenny Petrus and Melissa Scalia, who are our CAL FIRE staff that work uh, very closely with county staff on the preparation uh, and management of our contract, as well as budget. And then I just want to take a moment to um, thank Kay Archer Bowden um, for her uh, support uh, over the years of uh, the Paro Dunes um, contract um, in and just uh, thank her for all her service. And uh, if you'll just indulge me uh, just one minute, I have a small little gift to give to Kay for a little appreciation from us to her for her, for thank her you. efforts. Right. Thank you very much. And I also wanna take a moment to uh, just welcome uh, Charles Eady who will be replacing Kay and I look uh, forward to a, um, a developing a long-term uh, relationship uh, similar to what we've had with Kay. And with that, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. It's not often we get flowers at a budget hearing, so, uh, <laughs> but they're well-deserved. Well, uh, let the record reflect we didn't get them. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, uh, this, I just had two uh, questions about the budget. Okay. One is, um, it's concerning to see the decline in uh, the budget over the next two years. Um, if we don't do a ballot measure, what will that mean for county fire? Um, well, we'll have to look very hard at the uh, service level deliver that we currently are providing and see what the outcomes can be for that. It could um, be significant uh, based on what funding's available. Um, it could be you know, extreme, uh, the closure of a fire station and a reduction in service to the community. And uh, when we uh, have to uh, enter into negotiations on a new cal contract with CAL FIRE, should we be concerned about losing the, 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 the system of, of funding that we have right now, which is uh, CAL FIRE picking up the fire season and us picking up the non-fire season? I mean, w would there be any major changes? Not during fire season because we, we're, we're going to be obligated to continue to staff our fire stations on the CAL FIRE side. Uh, where you may see some um, uh, concerns would be whether we're able to uh, allocate any resources to staff stations in the wintertime uh, for emergency response. Um, typically we would reallocate those engines to fuel reductions and other state projects um, that we're not able to because we're staffing for the county fire department. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bowden, you want to speak to us? Yes. <laughs> Things are getting. Yes, I'm Kay Archer Bowden. Thank you for the flowers. Um, and I'm representing uh, the homeowners associations at Power Dunes, probably for the last time. Um, I started working on this uh, issue uh, 32 years ago. This was the first issue that uh, Power Dunes hired me to work on. And there was a terrible relationship between CAL FIRE and the homeowners at Pajaro Dunes. And uh, through the years, especially because CAL FIRE was so cooperative and so good at community relations, uh, there's now a really supportive atmosphere at Pajaro Dunes. Uh, they get 80, 90 percent approval on assessment votes. There are people out there who understand what the fire department does and uh, how valuable they are and how essential they are to a place like Pajaro Dunes. And um, the CAL FIRE through the years has given just outstanding service and um, not just in fire service but in community relations and I have done really, really well. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about Melissa Scalia and Ginny Petras who are the ones who are doing all the numbers and also are in charge of coming out and explaining all the numbers of Pajaro Dunes. And they do just a stunningly good job. So that's about all I want to say. It's been really wonderful working with you. And Charlie Eady, as he mentioned, will be replacing me. And I'm sure the relationship will continue as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Flowers. Well, well I, I, I just I, like to say about uh, uh, Ms. Bowden, you often have a difficult job 
uh, representing uh, the, the residents and interfacing with county government and the state. And you've always done that with uh, such great skill um, and you uh, t uh, tenaciously represented the residents of Pyro Dunes, but you've always done it in a way of collaboration and, and um, good communication uh, that has really been outstanding. So we will miss uh, you as part of this annual budget hearing process and the community will miss you in to just terms of your skills of being able to bring people together around critical issues. So thank you. Thank you. And just to add to that briefly, um, Kay is a fierce advocate for that entire section of the county, not just the dunes. And uh, the issues that you do deal with, with the local coastal plan, with fire protection, with coastal and sea level rise, with uh, condition of the roads, with agricultural interface, with flooding, with breaching of the Pajaro River, on and on and on, are always contentious issues and you have a, a set of homeowners that um, want access to their home, they want safety, there's guests and residents that want access to it that don't necessarily live here and don't understand the complexities of the system. You are always uh, a fierce advocate but respectful, polite and effective. And uh, it's a real model for a lot of people to continue in their interface with the government and for Charlie to try and uh, upkeep because it's tough to have a couple hundred people telling you something they want immediately in a system that isn't designed to move as quickly as people may want. But I think your actions have made people safer down there. Your work that you did to help with, with the river and set up a program for that, your work with the establishment of the fire department, which is beloved by everybody that lives there, uh, are a real testament. So I appreciate your work and you will be missed moving forward. Next speaker. Thank you, good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos Hills in the state responsibility area. Mr. Beaton, I like your jacket. <laughs> um, I am really happy I am able to be here this morning because I am really shocked to see that county fire budget is being decreased steadily over the next two years. And I wanna ask why, why would you agree to decrease fire protection support at a time when fire protection and defensible space increase is paramount in our state and being discussed continually, daily in the news. What liability are you taking on as supervisors by decreasing funding for the fire protection agency that serves the rural areas of the county, that serves the state parks and protects the populace? What liability are you taking on by agreeing to these decreases? They're unnecessary, there's money out there. I've come and talked with you many times about Proposition 172. County Fire gets zero, zero from the $18 million that rolls into this county for public safety. One half of 1% gets shunted through County Fire budget and passed on to the County Fire Chiefs Association. That is not acceptable. A one-time lump sum from this 172 money would bail County Fire out and give it all some breathing room and protect the citizens and the mountains that you are responsible for protecting public safety. I wanna also point out that um, zero of Measure G half cent sales tax will go to fund County Fire. It was used as a sales tactic for that sales tax increase, and that is wrong. It was deceptive. And people now think that they voted a sales tax in to help support fire. Maybe it does support fire within the county at large, but Ms. Mowbray's um, e explanation of how county fire funding comes, none of that Measure G money will help county fire. None of it will and you're agreeing to a decrease, a 13.7% decrease this year and an, an eight plus percent next year? I don't understand. At a time also when the federal government is saying that they're going to make it more onerous to reimburse the state and local governments for strike team expenses, and you're gonna decrease the money that you're willing to give our county fire department. That is not acceptable, and I'm here today to stand up for county fire and all of the residents and the ecosystems in the mountains. 
do not allow this decrease and fund county fire. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. If you'd like, I can address that issue. Um, sure. Uh, so, um, as we explained earlier, um, the current year expenditures in the budget were signif significantly elevated uh, because some contract li liquidations at the year end were not processed. Uh, they were, it was, an, it was just a miscommunication between uh, the department and the auditor controller about liquidating some of the, the contracts. It skewed the numbers for 1819, and this makes it look like we're spending less in 1920, but fire, county fire is actually spending more in 1920. So it's really an accounting error that took place. It's not a re real reduction that took place. In fact, county fire is getting, spending more money in the budget year than less. And this is explained, there was an email, I believe, sent back uh, to some of the individuals who asked questions about this. So, so anyway, I don't know if Mr. Beaton, if you want Mr. Beaton to explain more about it, or if that's. Yeah, I think it's helpful. Well, I mean, I, I, we can, but I feel like Chief Larkin went through this in his presentation. I mean, Ms. Steinbrenner, maybe you didn't hear the presentation, but this was explained in detail before you came up here and made those claims. So um, if you want, please, Mr. Beaton, explain it uh, if you feel it's necessary, but it was a, it was a slide. It was well explained by the chief. Um, I, I'm not really sure, maybe you missed that part of the budget presentation, but all that element was totally explained. Okay, anything else? Uh, is there a motion? I, I would move the recommended actions for uh, county fire. Sure, uh, so so mo mo motion by Leopold. Second. Second by Caput. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Um, then thank you very much and thank you to your whole team for the excellent service you provide. We're gonna move on to item number 47, which is uh, the, consider the 2019-21 proposed budgets for the district attorney, public administrator, as outlined in the reference budget documents, and schedule the continuing agreements list for the final approval on last budget day hearings uh, on June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the district attorney. So we'll give the district attorney a moment to come up. I want to say thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you to the board for having us before you again, uh, as we do every year, uh, to talk a little bit about our budget, what we uh, hope to accomplish, and frankly, a little bit of what we have accomplished. And I also want to take this time uh, to sincerely thank um, County Administrative Officer Carlos Palacios for his continued support as you have as the board supported us in our quest to bring public safety to this community. And we wanted to specifically thank uh, Nicole Coburn from the CAO's office, as well as Sven Stafford from the CAO's office. So uh, with that, um, we're gonna just go through our brief slide presentation and I will be brief. <laughs> um, and just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, responsibilities and the first responsibility that I want to speak about, which is uh, up on the slide, is the California Constitution that lays out uh, public safety as the first responsibility of local government and local officials, uh, and that there is an obligation to give priority to the provisions and adequacy uh, of public safety services. Uh, this is what we do, this is what we have taken an oath to do, and once again, wanna thank the board for your support uh, in enabling us to do this. The second thing I would like to just briefly touch on are um, the duties that the DA's office has, uh, and that duty primarily is to promote public safety in our community. We have a duty to follow various laws and statutes. Those are the United States Constitution, the California Constitution, California statutes, as well as the rules of professional conduct. We also have a duty to protect the rights of victims, 
and the rights of defendants, which I think surprises some people, but we as district attorneys are frankly the only person in the criminal justice system who takes an oath to do justice, and that includes protecting the rights not only of victims of crime, but actually of defendants. We have a duty that is set forth uh, to review cases and to file cases. We have a duty to investigate and prosecute cases, and we also have a duty to do this in an ethical and just manner. The DA's office in my time there uh, and under the tutelage of my predecessor and dear friend Bob Lee came up with a mission statement. And we have this on the walls uh, of the DA's office. It is our driving sort of uh, force whenever issues come about. And that is uh, to promote and ensure public safety through ethical and just prosecution. Um, it is, it is a, a guiding principle for everything that we do in that office. I also want to show you th this slide, which I know some of you have seen before, and that is essentially that the referring agencies that refer cases to our office. You can see that it's literally the ones that we are familiar with, which is every major police department and sheriff's office in this county, but we also get cases from various other sources. Um, we get them from UCSC Police Department, we get them from the Highway Patrol, we get them from state parks, fish and wildlife, uh, and other agencies. And it's our duty and our obligation to look at these cases when they come in, to make independent determinations about what, whether there are, are crimes that have been committed, whether we've identified the proper people, and whether we can actually go forward and file these cases. So I do think it's important uh, in the discussion of who the DA's office is and what we do, to understand that we are not a rubber stamp for any of the police agencies that we are tasked with and conduct independent assessments uh, of criminal cases. Oftentimes we investigate those or request follow-up uh, from the agencies to investigate those. Some of the highlights that I wanted to talk about for the 2018-2019 um, year is this MDIC. It's a multidisciplinary interview center uh, that we have now used for about a hundred forensic interviews, uh, typically in cases involving children uh, who are victims of sexual uh, assault. This is a center that you all supported uh, and frankly has buy-in from every law enforcement agency in this county. Uh, as well as Child Protective Services and Health Services to have uh, sort of a friendly, neutral, not police environment where children can be interviewed and the goal is to interview them one time or reduce the number of interviews, thereby reducing the trauma in a child-friendly environment. And I'm pleased to say that this is up and running and is doing fantastic and we are seeing nothing but increased use of the center as it gets going. We also continue to, out of the 14 inspectors that we have, two of them are uh, continuing to play the lead role and the number two role in the Santa Cruz County anti-crime team. Uh, we've got uh, people out there that are literally on the streets in a uh, frontline enforcement capacity, two from the DA's office and others from other jurisdictions sort of a force multiplier, and you can see the number of firearms that they are taking literally out of the hands of people that are ready to use them. Uh, the 285 parole probation searches that they have conducted, as well as these 372 field interviews, they also uh, have taken, as you can see, 975 grams of narcotics off the street by this sort of frontline enforcement, which as a DA's office, we believe is important. Uh, you need to work a problem from the front end and you need to work it from the back end. Uh, and these dedicated individuals from our office and, and from other agencies in the county literally are out there um, on the weekend, ev you know, in the evenings, uh, contacting people and uh, doing stops, doing searches, and uh, literally taking the guns out of the hands of people that are ready to use them. We also wanted to highlight the consumer and environmental protection uh, efforts that have taken place. You can see uh, that 
the year to date in terms of uh, enforcement actions for consumer protection. We have seized a total or gotten a total of $1.3 million uh, this year alone. My understanding is there's some other things that are in the hopper that are sitting, frankly, on the Attorney General's desk waiting for them to review. Uh, we are also out there in terms of civil penalties for environmental offenses. We collected $220,000 uh, this year, and we are really sort of redoubling our consumer and environmental protection efforts. There's a new public safety center that I know that you're all aware of that has opened mid-county. The goal there is to do more outreach in a centralized location for vulnerable uh, members of our community, elderly uh, in particular, and other members, and to focus on environmental protection uh, and environmental issues. The Victim uh, Witness Assistance Program, which is an important part of the DA's office, these are individuals who literally help uh, victims of crime through the court process, whether that's actually going to court and assisting them or uh, paying for compensation uh, for relocation, for locks on the doors and those sort of things. Um, and you can see from uh, the documents here that we were able to successfully get $1.1 million in grants uh, to try to help that. We are pleased to say that we have instituted a therapy uh, and comfort dog program, which is uh, paid for by grant funding, and that is Nailani, who is actually here today, sitting in the front. Uh, 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 hold on just a second. Certainly. Mr. Adam, Okay, please go ahead. So uh, that dog, the point of that dog is to assist people who have been victims of crime uh, in terms of uh, going to court. Mr. O sorry, Mr. Alexander, you've been warned. You can either sit down or leave. Shut up. Okay, you're, um, please leave. Do we need to adjourn the meeting? Okay, we'll adjourn, we'll take a 15 minute break while Mr. Alexander is exhorted from this meeting. Thank you. All right, so we are, uh, we are back and uh, we will continue with the district attorney's presentation on his budget item. Thank you. Uh, I think we finished up with uh, the, the dog and the year to date claims that have been processed by um, the Victim Witness Center. I want to also say that we ran a seminar uh, this year on human trafficking. This is a problem that is uh, existing nationwide and it's something that's come to the forefront of a lot of people's attention recently. And we decided that it was something that we wanted to sort of take a role, a lead role and look into. We had a countywide human trafficking symposium that literally had about 300 people uh, from different aspects of county government and private sectors. And we had a speaker who literally uh, had, was trafficked herself, has uh, an unbelievable story, um, was quite familiar with our area having been trafficked at certain points in this community. And it was really kind of a, uh, the first time, frankly, in my experience to see so many people from different agencies, not just law enforcement, health services, human services, uh, faith-based groups, community groups sort of come together. And it is literally step one for us. So the first step was to try to educate ourselves. Uh, and the second step is to sort of try to put together a comprehensive pro approach to dealing with this problem. It's a problem that has sort of immediate interim and long term issues. In other words, if you are able to help somebody who is trafficked, their, their needs do not stop just when the court case is over. There's continuing needs for support. Uh, for education, for all sorts of, of things. So we really are trying to come up with and work in this community with a comprehensive approach to this problem. And I suspect what is also going to be uh, happening down the line is we will have more targeted sort of uh, enforcement actions when it comes to human trafficking once we have sort of in place a more robust system of care for, for individuals who've been trafficked. Um, and finally, um, 
I just wanted to hit a, a couple of the budgetary items. Uh, we. The, there are 7.06 million in total revenues. The expenditures are 20.3 million. Um, there's total funding, uh, staff funding of 104 full-time employees. Uh, this year, we've been try, as we have every year, to be sort of responsible in our requests, not expand uh, in areas that we don't need. But we have requested, uh, and the, the budget proposes a full-time DA inspector uh, with the increasing demands that we have, and a full-time program coordinator uh, that will be able to do outreach and coordinate some of the um, sort of social messages that we need to get out there. Uh, you can see that we have vacancies, full-time vacancies um, uh, that are listed and unfunded staff positions uh, as listed. So uh, the status quo budget uh, is anticipated for 2021 and a lot of the increases uh, that we have had are just uh, cost increases for existing staff. Uh, and I do want to thank the board in the past for helping us retain the staff that we have. Um, our operational objectives, uh, we have talked about a little bit, increasing community awareness of human trafficking, expanding services provided to the child interview center that we, we spoke about, which uh, on a daily basis is being used more and more, to leverage uh, technology and streamline existing discovery procedures so that we can be more efficient uh, in terms of providing discovery to uh, defense attorneys and that sort of thing. We've also, uh, the court changed over to a new computer system several years ago. We used to get information from that system and I'm pleased to report that we are back in a position to gain and are gaining information from the court systems so that we can be more efficient with the use of our uh, staff time. We're really with the the new safety center uh, trying to do more proactive outreach uh, investigation for environmental uh, violations as well as consumer protection violations. We're interested in doing front end education as I know some of you are aware having uh, done some of this outreach in your communities uh, specifically, but it's something that we are very interested. We as an office pride ourselves on front end and back end sort of solutions, which I think is uh, the most appropriate sort of way to combat things. And we are also, as I mentioned before, uh, we've got two people in the uh, anti-crime team, the gang team, if you will, and we are looking at doing outreach with those particular individuals into our community in a proactive way to children that are, you know, relatively young, because that's what they're seeing, is that young people are being effective uh, affected by gang members and environmental factors and they're really interested. They came to us and said we would like to try to do some focused intervention at younger ages, which is one of our goals. And also educating the community and law enforcement uh, on the effects of criminal activity <laughs> and prosecution on crime survivors. We've done some studies and we are part of some ongoing studies getting feedback from people who are survivors of crime, victims of crime, uh, if you will, on how we can improve the process uh, and uh, we are taking all of that information to heart. And finally, uh, researching the feasibility for operating a new neighborhood court to use some of the restorative justice principles. This is one of the things that had come out of Safe on Crime uh, with uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General, and various other folks. And one of the things that San Francisco, for example, is utilizing in other places is a neighborhood court system. So we have... Um, agreed to research the feasibility of a neighborhood court system to see how we could effectively use that and um, try to resolve low-level criminal cases without necessarily clogging the courts um, and uh, expending resources that we don't need to. So with that, uh, I don't have anything else to, to really say except thank you for your continued support of DA's office in particular and public safety, and I'm certainly open to any questions uh, that anybody has.
Sure, first, thank you for your work and keeping our community safe. Second, I just had a quick question. The environmental law violations, what kind of environmental law violations are you seeing? There's all sorts of environmental laws. We talk about there's stream bed, you know, sometimes you will have individuals who for whatever reasons are redirecting sort of stream beds. Uh, for their own sort of personal use, thereby affecting wildlife and that sort of things. We have uh, people who are just straight up polluting. Um, we have, sometimes you will find illegal grows that are using pesticides and other sort of things um, that are literally polluting uh, our, our public lands in, in many cases. So those are a lot of the environmental things that we see. We also see cases from fish and game uh, people, you know, uh, impacting the bay and taking things that they shouldn't take or in quantities they shouldn't take. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, the work that you do, and uh, I've uh, enjoyed uh, working with a member of your office, Tamara George, on the uh, uh, Justice and Gender Task Force. She's uh, made a great contribution there. Um, uh, I really appreciate the way in which you're looking at the operational objectives because they really cover the, 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 the wide uh, swath of, of the things you do in the district attorney's office. Um, the human trafficking piece, I know uh, a SATA staff member who has some experience with this and, and went to um, the, uh, the conference and was just, was really knocked out by uh, the material there um, and really thought that it was great that we were focusing on this issue. And um, I, I think that raising the awareness is important, but do we have any information about increase in the number of human trafficking cases? I mean, I, th we don't, that wouldn't be a, a requirement, but, it, but I'm just, I, awareness I, it becomes important. I can tell you this, that the way that typically we see them now, um, and things have changed with the advent of computer uh, and social media uh, sort of contacts with people who are trafficked. Um, I can tell you that in terms of, of trafficking, it's something that is not necessarily obvious to us. We get cases, we get cases when things happen, we get cases from various jurisdictions and investigate those. And as you might be aware, they are very difficult to get people sort of on board uh, to, to prosecute. Uh, and on board to sort of get out of the situation that they're in. Um, this was literally step one. This was bringing some individuals uh, who were trafficked, frankly were trafficked at certain points in our community, uh, and we're describing how certain things are here that we just don't see them. So the idea was step one, educate. Step two, sort of figure out the pieces from the law enforcement piece to the social service piece to the, uh, the community groups so that we can provide continuum of support for individuals. Um, and then once that's in place and you have a comprehensive sort of plan, um, you're in a much better position to sort of target these things. So uh, in terms of the numbers, it's still something that is difficult, I think, to see. Sure. Uh, we, in speaking to people who have firsthand knowledge, have every confidence that it does exist. Um, but in terms of the absolute numbers, I think that's a difficult thing right now until we sort of take a deeper dive into it to find out. Sure, I've participated in some rising international events and, and spoken to uh, some women who've been trafficked in our community. Yes. And so, uh, and I uh, imagine as we raise the awareness, then we will actually see probably a larger number of cases uh, because uh, there's a lot of it that's flying under the radar, right? Yes, I think that's a true statement and that certainly is our hope. On the multidisciplinary interview center, I'm really glad to see the success of that. Um, th the uh, wanting to see more people does that mean there's a waiting list right now, or is, it, is, is there any delay in people being interviewed because? No. Okay. No, I, in fact, I just was down the other day, there were three separate interviews. It comes, sometimes it comes in waves, uh, and you need to be flexible, but no, there, there is not a waiting list. I mean, these are, we have a dedicated inspector who's literally full-time uh, running that center and conducting interviews, and uh, if somebody needs an interview, they get it, and they get it in short order. But I think what we're seeing is, um, law enforcement is looking at this model and saying we can use it here, we can use it here, you can use it for people who are witnesses also, not just victims of, of child abuse. Sure. Um, so it's, it's uh, literally on a daily basis we're seeing more and more sort of use of this center. 
Great. Um, on the gang prevention efforts, I think you can't ever t take the, uh, your foot off the pedal and making no. sure uh, about gang prevention. Um, I'm wondering, do you see this new outreach program connected into the existing youth violence prevention task force work? Yeah, uh, I, I there's think- been a lot of, There's been a lot of efforts around that. No, there have been, and <laughs> I think it's absolutely parallel. Our sort of, the impetus for this was listening to these uh, officers that are on the street, right? They've got f absolute firsthand boots on the ground information, and what they are telling us is it, it's looking to them uh, like kids need to be uh, sort of uh, educated and targeted from a law enforcement, from a social service perspective, from a health service perspective earlier. And they, I know that they've done some outreach at this point to the schools to try to get uh, kind of a, uh, their foot in the door that way and then go out and sort of target a lot of the, the younger people. And I do think there's a lot of overlap and, and certainly um, some crossover for sure. Yeah, I mean, it would be great not to have it just run parallel, but leverage what's going on there, those relationships, because I think there's, there's, you know, that we have schools at the table and those social service agencies, those relationships with young people, and it, to the extent that, w that we could, um, uh, harness the uh, the energy of the two efforts, that would be great. Yes, I, I actually agree with you, for sure. Uh, the last area that, that I'll uh, talk about is the neighborhood uh, courts. I'm very excited to see the examination. I know you and I have talked about this uh, before. I think there's a good model, and you know, we had, uh, um, you know, part of uh, Smart on Crime and a bunch of other agencies held a restorative justice uh, panel here uh, last November. And uh, that was well attended. Members of your staff were there. Uh, and one of the things they talked about was the uh, neighborhood courts uh, program. Um, I think there, there could be a real benefit to our community. And I think uh, I look forward uh, to the work as you look at this to, to see how we can make this happen throughout the county. Um, I think it would be a real benefit for everyone involved. And uh, reducing the, whatever the clogging of the courts are right. would uh, obviously be very helpful. So whatever we can do to be helpful, and I, pre I look forward to talking to you about it more. Well, over thank the you next for year. that support. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, building again on the MDIC, that was really your vision. I know it's been implemented in a lot of other counties, but to see uh, that do so well here is, is concerning on the one side that, that it's needed, but on the other side is a remarkable opportunity for victims to not feel like they're being re-victimized through the process. Uh, so I appreciate your work on that. I also appreciate your willingness to come into the Aptos Village along with uh, Sheriff Hart. We're looking forward to, especially on the seniors' crimes and the fraud, having those trainings, having that outreach into the second district will be important. Uh, to have the presence of all of you there already from probation, the DA and the Sheriff's Office has already made a difference. A lot of people are coming in on the walk-in side. And one of the things that I, I like to point out during the budget time is just a reminder about the fact that how when law enforcement, which is frontline, and you have frontline as well, but when law enforcement handles a case, in many respects, the case is handed off and it could take literally years by the time that something's adjudicated and it makes uh, people don't recognize that there's somebody working on that case the entire time. And as you know, it's when you walk into court, it's you're for the people, and, and uh, I, I recognize the victims generally feel alone in that case, and I recognize that literally it's the state of California versus, and, and uh, you represent that, and I appreciate the fact that you keep victims up front in that sense and make sure that you walk them through that entire process, not just you, but your victim advocate and all the attorneys that work for you. These cases go on for an exceptionally long time, uh, and there's multiple cogs within the system from uh, the frontline law enforcement to what you do. Uh, to the probation side on the back end as well, and, and I just appreciate your work, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult, difficult job, and there are some things that are coming in on the, both the national and international side that you have to deal with that I don't know that a lot of people are aware of. So, again, thank you and your team for your work. Thank you for your support. Yes, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, um, I really, you have a, a wide variety of issues that you have to uh, face, uh, very sadly in some respects. Um, you know, in the gang prevention issue, is a uh, when does this when do they try to draw these kids in 10 to 12 years old it's the information we're getting is that younger and younger um and i think it's it's a scenario they were talking they really uh have spoken about trying to go into fifth sixth grade seventh grade classes uh to try to explain sort of what is what is out there and how 
you know, uh, you may want to avoid these things and, and try to talk to them from a perspective that has credibility. Um, right. And it, it's, you know, uh, I was surprised, you know, these guys are out, the inspectors and, and the others are out there sort of combating uh, generally older kids, although they're, they're taking guns out of the hands of juveniles too, and really they are the ones who said, hey look, we really think there's a need because as time goes on, it just seems that it's getting younger and younger. Uh, in terms of targets and, and uh, people who are focused on gang uh, sort of recruitment and that sort of thing. And uh, they're talking about, you know, the age groups that, I, that I've talked about. Yeah. Younger, a little younger than the BASTA sort of model which is out there. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I want to thank the educational systems that we have here too for cooperating uh, in that effort. It's, um, it's very important, it's, it's sad that that's, but that's a, a, a place where we can uh, maybe really uh, give them information and, um, right. and, so, uh, and a preventative effort. I want to especially, uh, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said about the, uh, inter, uh, the multidisciplinary um, in the neighborhood uh, or interview center and the uh, neighborhood court system, but I, I want to really say thank you for your attention in the office uh, and consumer fraud protection and uh, those among seniors, Doug Allen in particular, that's been out in my district several times. Um, one of the things that's elder abuse, it's just amazing. It's, uh, it's increasing too at, at a pretty good rate, I, I believe too, and uh, if, if there's, so, uh, you know, the elderly, they don't, they're not uh, savvy to the, the computer systems and whatever, whatever model's coming out. If they wanted to get to a hotline and say, hey, I've got a concern here, could, is there a, a basic hotline they should call? They can call the DA's office uh, right now. We do have, and we instituted in the last year or so, a computerized sort of uh, form that they can fill out, but they are always welcome to call either the DA's office and where we can direct them to wherever they need to go. They can also call local law enforcement in the jurisdictions that they're in uh, to try to get the ball rolling on this. And you do point out an important part of uh, what our commitment is, and that is trying to do education on the front end to seniors. Uh, going out into the community and with the, it, this Aptos Service Center, hopefully having people be able to come there um, to prevent sort of front end uh, abuse. But yes, there, there's, there's a, a number, you can call the DA's office, you can call the Sheriff's Department, you can call the Santa Cruz Police Department, whoever, sort of the jurisdiction that you're in. And if they can get online, there's actually a complaint form that they can fill out and comes to our office okay, and gets I filtered. You. Thank you for being, having that, you, you've had that available for some time though, yeah. but uh, in the elder abuse issue, is that, been more reports of that too in the it's, recent years? It's funny because, that? Yeah, well, we, it depends. There's physical abuse, then there's financial abuse, uh, and they're different uh, animals typically. Uh, we have recently prosecuted a lot of physical abuse cases in the courts, some very serious that you, you may be familiar with. Um, and I will say uh, the scams that are out there, which one of the positions that we have is this new position, um, that we're hoping will be used to educate and to push out information about the latest scams. Because as soon as you, you hear about one, the social security scam or the jury duty, there's another one around the corner um, that yeah. seems to be popping up. And I, I, I can't stress how important we think it is to get education out there to prevent people on the front end from becoming victims. Yeah. Thank you very much for your work and well, everybody in the office. Thank you for your support. Supervisor Capitol. I appreciate all you're doing too, and you have such a, a difficult balancing act to do with uh, what's right and what's wrong in a certain situation. Well, you mentioned scams. Uh, uh, do, you, do you get them on your cell phone too? <laughs> I mean, I, I do. I do. I got one the other day that explained to me that I missed jury duty, which I was quite certain I did not miss. <laughs> right. Um, yes, you. I do. I, I don't. We have had discussions about. Um, how to look into that and how to try to prevent that and what we're finding, not only my office, but when I have conversations with other DA's offices, those uh, numbers can now be mimicked, right? It, I, I get them in their, the prefixes for my, my uh, community. And what we're finding as we try to delve deeper into this is that a lot of, the, they're all cloned or mimicked, but a lot of these are offshore phone numbers sure. that are coming in. 
Um, I got one recently from Slovenia uh, in the middle of the night, and I was pretty sure I didn't know anyone in Slovenia, and then I did a little research uh, in the morning, and sure enough, it's a, it was a scam. And then uh, briefly, uh, what I would ask, uh, the, not getting into extre extremes, because when you're dealing with uh, human trafficking and drugs and all that, um, uh, you know, it, you can go from the wall all the way to an open border and everything like that. So you do have to deal uh, sometimes with ICE, and they're not always wrong, right? They're sometimes looking for somebody that is actually, uh, you know, it's a very serious thing. There are scenarios, I will say this, I, and maybe I should have told, mentioned this. We have, uh, with the cooperation of the FBI, the U.S. Marshals, and local law enforcement, Sheriff's Office, the last one, and uh, Santa Cruz Padilla on the one before, been able to secure eight individuals who have fled to Mexico uh, and been brought back to stand trial, uh, most of those for homicide cases. And in the old days, uh, and I've been here since 94, if you fled to Mexico, uh, either as an American citizen or even as a, a Mexican citizen, the chances of getting you back uh, in California or in Santa Cruz to stand trial were very, very, very minimal chances to get to get you back. But I will say this, two of the inspectors, uh, particularly in my office, have traveled to Mexico and built relationships. And those relationships and the cooperation with the U.S. Marshal Service, with um, the uh, FBI on many of the cases, have led to us bringing back uh, people who committed horrible, brutal murders um, to uh, to stand trial. So there has been some cooperation with various federal sure. agencies, uh, which frankly is necessary in order to bring some of these people back to stand justice, or stand yeah. trial, get justice. And, and with some of the, uh, some of the problems uh, uh, like human trafficking and, uh, and whatever, uh, what percentage are uh, underage and what percentage are Adults. I, I, that's a very good question, and I can. I don't think we have a handle in this community necessarily on how many are underage and how many are adults. I can tell you uh, that in our our dealings with this, we have seen both. Um, but in terms of a statistical breakdown, I, I, I unfortunately don't have an answer, and that's part of the reason we're sort of getting this going is so that we can really sort of identify what's taking place in our community uh, and do targeted enforcement. I know, it's, it's hard to have a specific answer, but it's something that we're all looking at. And uh, for example, uh, how much is uh, coming from uh, uh, across the border? And how I, much is homegrown? There's, uh, I can tell you this, the person, you know, I, I think a lot of us may have in our mind, uh, this is what a person who's trafficked, you know, should look, this is their background, this is where they should sort of work and all that. And the person who uh, came and is a survivor literally went to a private school, uh, came from a family that was wealthy, uh, or at least upper middle class, um, got involved in what she thought was a modeling um, audition and was kidnapped at gunpoint uh, and then literally forced into a life of sexual trafficking. So I, I think the lesson that we are learning is trafficking uh, can cut across sort of all, it's like domestic violence, it happens in sure. all segments of our community. And uh, certainly there's, there's um, segments that we think of somebody being trafficked from, you know, a foreign country that's brought here, but, but I don't think by any means that is necessarily uh, uh, the majority or, or the model. You're that right. that it cuts across all boundaries. And, and this, I could ask the same question of the sheriff's department when they're up here too. But it, it would be basically you're all working together, and you have that is the absolute plan. We are we are. It's a coordinated effort between everybody in law enforcement in this community, but not just the law enforcement, but social services, uh, community groups, and that sort of thing. Because as you might imagine, somebody who's trafficked doesn't necessarily have resources. Some people don't have education. They have no means. Uh, you, you, by which to support themselves uh, outside of that. So it's not just the court and the law enforcement piece, which is what we're learning, but it's how to take care of them, how to help them, how to, to plug them into a, a life, actually, so that they can be successful uh, as they move through their life. 
Uh, and that's the difficult part. That's what really requires this coordinated effort across not just law enforcement, but other aspects and segments of our society. Right, and I, I wanna thank your department. You've helped, uh, you know, in District 4 and uh, some specific cases and in, in general, uh, just uh, hypothetically, uh, uh, if somebody does lose their home and they're elderly and they were taken advantage of maybe by somebody, somebody in the family or it could be somebody outside the family, um, in some cases you're able to help out where they, they get some of the money back because the bank does want the money. Uh, on the mortgage. Yeah, elder financial abuse is something that we absolutely are deeply committed to. And uh, I would just encourage uh, anybody who is within earshot, if you know somebody who is a victim of financial abuse, please contact either the law enforcement agency or the DA's office as soon as you, you can so that we can maybe freeze bank accounts and do certain things to try to uh, compensate people and make them whole. And if anybody is watching or lis listening, what you're saying, you actually do, because yeah. you've done it in District 4, and uh, everybody appreciates it, you know. Yeah. We're, we're deeply committed to protecting all of the community, but we're also deeply committed to protecting vulnerable members of our community, oh, yeah. uh, which include the elderly. You so. bet. And then I guess the last one would be, uh, let's see. Um, survivors, uh, children of survivors, L let's say financially or whatever, or uh, domestic violence or something comes up, is there some kind of fund that helps them out to the family that's, because Social Security can't jump in right away and welfare, I don't know, I, you know, it's so confusing and in a, in a, you have a couple of kids that are, you know, 10 years old, eight years old, it's not their fault and all of a sudden there's no money. Right, no, I can tell you our victim assistance program uh, is multifaceted. They will actually go with people, help people through the court system, which is maybe the most obvious sort of role that they play. But they are also behind the scenes filling out all sorts of financial claims for people. So they take care of burial expenses, they take care of relocation expenses, okay. they take care of uh, people who, uh, children who need counseling. And there's a whole host of sort of money that is out there, state money and some federal money. Uh, that they, their job and what they are happy to do is to try to plug people in uh, to make sure that people are as sort of whole as they can be after a traumatic incident. Is that the consumer affairs part of it? It's the, well, consumer affairs may bring it in, but that's our victim witness assistance. Well, okay. So it's the vic it's basically people whose job is to assist yeah. victims. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for your support. I appreciate it. Great, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item. If you'd like to speak, please come forward. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, I was wondering, um, I, we heard the uh, district attorney say that there's a phone number for people to contact when they hear things out of order, or also to contact your lo local law enforcement. Um, <coughs> The district attorney has been told some time ago of two people up here that are sending bouquets back and forth, and that was by John Leopold and Zach Friend gave threats of violence to members of the Grange, two different Granges, one on 17th and one in Aptos. Um, in fact, in the one in Aptos, they threatened something might happen to their building. Uh, these complaints were made both to your department and to the sheriff, I have never heard a word back. I'm wondering if, like we see in the House of Cards in the very first episode, there's special treatment uh, to people that violate the law that happen to be working for the county or for your or another department. Um, there has been a transition from self-government uh, to regional government, moving authorities uh, from councils and cities to a cog called AMBAG. This is deliberate. Um, Freedom Forum, which they destroyed, uh, was in existence uh, for over a decade. John Leopold attended one of the candidates' nights. Uh, we also found that the other threats came from an outfit called COPA. It's a group of three or four churches. It's funded by the Panetta Institute. I wanna show you the censorship that's been increasing all the time. We've got Leon Panetta, 
Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Coonerty and we got Zach Friend over here. Uh, Ryan Coonerty has adopted, and this whole board has adopted a thing called the Rosen, uh, Rosenberg Rules, which absolutely destroy access for people's access to the podium. In fact, we saw yesterday a, a complete break in what he was presenting, and that was uh, he asked for public comment on the consent calendar, but it's been refused. There is no consistency. This board arbitrarily shuts people down uh, day in and day out. Uh, Mr. Coonerty is uh, very closely related with the Resource Center, uh, which sponsored actually the very same speaker that was scheduled uh, for the two Granges. Um, and I, we noticed, because this is a sanctuary city giving you a lot of extra problems, there was no questions about how many of these people are illegal. Uh, these people serve the Panetta machine. And I also encourage you to instruct your people on the Brown Act, uh, the violations even by your armed people that are not directly uh, employed by the uh, government or the sheriff's department are not familiar with the freedom people have. The previous speaker had just won a lawsuit uh, in Santa Clara for the same thing that happened to him today. Thank you. That can Thank you. Is there any other person who'd like to speak to us on the consent agenda? For the record, I have attended two freedom forums. <laughs> okay. Uh, seeing none, I will close uh, public com comment and bring it back to the board for uh, deliberation and action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by friend, second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your work. Uh, we'll now move on to item number 48 to consider the 2019 to 2021 proposed budgets for the probation department as outlined in the reference budget document. Schedule the continuing agreement list for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the chief probation officer. Good morning, Chair Good morning. Board of Supervisors, Mr. Palacios. Um, Fernando Draldo, Chief Probation Officer. Uh, with me here today is Valerie Thompson, my Assistant Chief Probation Officer. It's a pleasure to be here before you to present our fiscal year 2019-21 uh, proposed budget. We appreciate the opportunity to highlight a few of the many ways my staff contribute to public safety. A uh, new feature this year and in the coming years will be to highlight our progress in achieving departmental objectives as identified in the county operational plan. Before I begin, I want to thank the CAO office and their staff for the continued support of probation and allowing us to fill, fulfill our vision and mission, which is driven by my innovative and passionate staff. I want to thank my staff for their dedicated work each and every day to promote public safety in the most unique and meaningful ways. With me here today behind me is my leadership team. Uh, they're right behind me. I have Melissa Allen, our administrative services manager. We have Sarah Ryan, who's our superintendent of the juvenile hall, and Sarah Fletcher, our adult services director. I'm excited to share our department's objectives and key steps from the county operational plan. Throughout today's presentation, I'll, I will also demonstrate the alignment between my department's strategic plan and the county's plan and our work to operationalize both of these plans. This past year, I had the honor of chairing the Comprehensive Health and Safety Operational Steering Committee. It was a new and exciting opportunity to work with other departments. Uh, to assist in the design of the operational plan. Most of our strategies and objectives exist in the focus area of comprehensive health and safety. Today, I hope to demonstrate the progress we have made in meet, meeting key objectives of both of our plans. I'm gonna take a moment and let you know what probation is. We occupy numerous lanes of the criminal justice system, therefore a brief explanation of all that we do is in order. We are part of the public safety and justice category of the budget and part of the comprehensive health and safety focus area and the county strategic and operational plans. As a criminal justice sanction, probation is a tool that holds people convicted of crimes accountable and helps oversee the rehabilitation using evidence-based rehabilitation strategies. Evidence-based practices are supported by scientific research to reduce recidivism. The goal of prevention is to prevent crime and delinquency, reduce recidivism, restore victims, and promote healthy families and communities by doing the following. We administer research-based juvenile and adult programs. 
We make recommendations to the courts and enforce its orders in communities in our community by providing supervision and treatment for juveniles and adults. And we oversee the management and operation, programming and administration of our juvenile uh, detention facility. I want to take a minute and review our progress related to Objective 172 the, and the County Operational Plan. Open a new public safety center in Aptos Village. Based on this photo, I think we all have made good progress. For the first time in many years, we've expanded and enhanced our accessibility to services at key locations throughout the county. One of the strategies in the public health and safety focus area of the operational plan was to develop the facilities necessary to foster shared safety and opportunities. We are pleased to partner with our sheriff, district attorney, and supervisor friend and increase accessibility for our clients by opening a probation offices for the first time ever in Mid-County in our Mid-County location at the Aptos Village Public Safety Center. There we will house our adult uh, investigations unit and have a drop-in space for both ad adult and juvenile officers. Um, this, again, will provide a better and much needed access for, uh, to our community and also for our community to come visit us uh, when necessary. Um, these these um, goals uh, help us met our own internal uh, department objective plan, which was our goal number three, which uh, you don't have before you, but which was to enhance and increase partnerships with justice stakeholders. So we're making progress. I've included this photo in case you've ever wondered what it's like to have a high number of elected officials and your county administrative officer watch you use a pair of large scissors. <laughs> this, this, this is what it looks like, and it can be very nerve wracking. I, I assure you it is. That's our public safety center, and I do thank you, uh, our, our service center, and thank you for attending. So about a month ago, as, as you're aware, we opened our probation service center at 303 Water Street, right across the street. Uh, and I do, again, thank you all for attending this event. We are making progress in meeting objective 161, which is by June 2020, probation will serve 10% of all new clients at the service center. Opening the service center was one of our comprehensive health and safety goals. The service center is a partnership with multiple service providers and county partners that will allow for rapid referrals to critical services that address key criminogenic needs of our probation officers. We'll be co-locating service, multiple service providers and we'll start services such as substance use disorder treatment, mental health services, benefits, employment, et cetera. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our uh, accomplishments uh, in fiscal year 2018-19. One of the goals uh, for our pretrial services uh, for fiscal year 1819 was to improve our ability to gather, track, and analyze data. This past year, we were able to implement a new pretrial module in our case management system. The result is that we are now better to record and analyze more complex data. It, it also allows us to use the technology that exists with clients, uh, which one of those is to uh, remind them of their court hearings. Um, or other alerts like please charge your GPS. That's helpful to clients. <clears throat> the juvenile division continues to focus on youth and family engagement to support youth remaining safely in their communities while reducing over-reliance on out-of-home placements, the use of which renders poor outcomes. Our, today, our juvenile director, our assistant director, and some juvenile probation officers are attending the chief probation officers Continuum of Care Reform Annual Conference in San Diego are now uh, representing us and talking about our county and our accomplishments in reducing the use of out-of-home placement through the success of child and family team meetings. In 2018, we saw a historically low average daily population of youth in custody. As you are aware, we are not alone in seeing this precipitous, precipitous drop in the number of youth detained in juvenile halls throughout California. We are far ahead of the curve back in the early 2000s when we started our Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative work, and thankfully many others across the state and across the country have caught on. We also had the foresight to not build expensive, new, shiny, large facilities that unfortunately many other counties did. They now find themselves with brand new juvenile halls or newly added units that sit empty. Locally, we had started a conversation along with county officials, local leaders, and other thought partners about our next steps related to our juvenile hall. I've commissioned a detention utilization study and assure you we will be thoughtful and consider, informed through data and community needs, all options that exist 
as the county reconsiders our numerous facility needs. We will keep our county and community engaged and informed. Here is how the probation department is structured. We have three divisions, each with unique responsibilities that are tied together by our department strategic plan. One of our strategic priorities in our 2016 to 2021 strategic plan was operational excellence with a goal of alignment between the three divisions. I'm gonna show you, um, this illustrates our caseloads as of the December 31st, 2018 in the adult services. Since 2014, we've seen an overall 30% decrease in active supervision cases. While the numbers are, are less, we are seeing more cases with moderate to high needs levels. In a perfect world, we'd have the right resources needed to properly supervise <coughs> them. This is not the case from many of our clients who are not on specialized caseloads. And while there's been an overall reduction in caseload size, certain specialized populations have increased. As you see, there's a 31% increase in the AB109 population overall. Trends also continue to show an increase in our pre-adjudication involvement for the probation with pre-trial populations booming and pre-sentence investigation reports on the rise along, as along with a backlog and new legislative mandates like Proposition 63. Here are some of our budget highlights. The total proposed budget that supports our three divisions for fiscal year 1920 is nearly $25 million. There's a total overall increase of 4.9%. The general fund contribution is nearly 7.5 million, an increase of 21.5%. Revenues for us are down this year. At the start of the uh, budget development cycle in January of this year, we had to close a nearly $3 million gap as is the case in most budget years, our operational expenses, which includes our salaries, benefits, have increased significantly. There was actually for 1920 a $1.3 million increase, and for <coughs> fiscal year 2000, 2021, there'll be another million dollar increase. Additionally, we lost nearly $1.5 million in grant revenues, and we, knew, we anticipated some of that, but not all of it. So our revenues relying on um, state allocations have really not kept up with our operational expenses. Our costs continue to outpace revenues and therefore staffing levels have stayed flat and even decreased slightly. So uh, this trend doesn't really match our, uh, our workload increases, particularly in the adult division. I'll sh give you one example of where funding decreased that um, we did not anticipate. Uh, was in SB 678. Um, we lost nearly $500,000, um, and without the support of the county general fund uh, increase, this could have resulted in a loss of positions. Um, a small part of our budget challenge was offset by the move of two of our IT analysts to ISD to centralize positions in the county. Our current funding as a, a challenges really exist in the adult services division, and that's why I'm focusing on that quite a bit. That's where, uh, uh, while caseloads have decreased, um, we're, we have more requirements um, with those moderate to high level need cases. And we have three focus areas in adult services. It's our largest, divis our largest division and has numerous responsibilities. So we provide a full spectrum of services operating around three major focus areas, pre-trial services, court coverage and investigations, and community-based supervision. Our pre-trial unit completes assessments and makes recommendations regarding the release of detention, release or detention of clients pending criminal charges and provides monitoring to those deemed eligible by the courts to re uh, remain safely in the community. In 2018, our staff completed a remarkable 2,700 public safety assessments. Our investigations unit conducts pre-sentence and pre-plea investigations and makes sentence and recommendations based on statutory mandates outlined in the penal code and rules of the court. We also staff three felony courts and several review courts each week. The remaining units and majority of the division staff provide various levels of community supervision for individuals placed on formal probation, those released from state prison on post-release community supervision, and those serving a portion of their local prison commitment here in our jail. All our officers pro also provide court coverage in those three felony courts and in the review courts as well. In 2018, pretrial staff completed over 2,700 assessments using, utilizing the public safety assessment 
tool and decision-making framework to inform judicial decision for release or detention pending case disposition. Utilizing the least restrictive means necessary to ensure public safety and appearance in court, staff continue to monitor an unprecedented number of pretrial defendants in the community while continuing to keep a high safety rate of 92%, which means 92% did not reoffend. And this is while our population has increased by 215% since 2014. So you can see today, um, um, uh, June 20th, 2000. 19, we probably are super, probably have about 130 individuals that we're supervising on pretrial. I want to talk a little bit about our adult caseloads. 27% of adult probation caseloads are considered specialized, meaning they have specific needs that require specialized interventions and training. For example, sex offenders require a different type of supervision, and that's known as the containment model. Domestic violence offenders have unique requirements to fulfill, such as the mandatory 52-week domestic violence class. Where we're struggling is really not in those specialized caseloads, but it's in all the other caseloads. Well, we have uh, a lot of probationers that are, that are assigned to, to the non-specialized caseloads who have multiple needs, yet we're not entirely able to, to properly serve them. Although I'll talk about some new resources that we, our county will be receiving that would help in that. This photo was taken at the first ever Santa Cruz County Employee Job Fair on May 22nd. You see my staff here doing a terrific job speaking to the public about our work and hopefully recruiting our next generation of probation staff. One of our strategic priorities in the probation department's 2016 to 21 strategic plan is staff development and engagement. Our goal is to attract, develop, and retain exemplary, motivated, and, and engaged staff. This goal nicely aligns with personnel objective number one, number 52, which is talent acquisition. It's really great to see how our own department's plan really aligns and supports our counter operational plan. Keeping new and current staff safe has always been of the utmost importance to the leadership team at probation. Over the past six years, we uh, have a new renewed focus of safety for all of our staff. One of the strategic priorities in the department's strategic plan was developing a field safety training program. This was accomplished in 2018 and led by our awesome line staff. Because of the excellent training and equipment our staff are issued and or have access to, we have never had a probation staff seriously injured on the job. We are grateful for their safety each day and our successful work with the safety committee continues to maintain these great outcomes. I wanna take a moment and just share some of the equipment and training programs we've implemented and will be implementing in the upcoming year. Starting in fiscal year 1920, we'll start piloting a new taser program for our probation officers. This will be rolled out after July 1. If approved uh, in fiscal year 1920, we'll have a sheriff deputy embedded at our department to assist with special transports and special visits where backup may be required and help us increase uh, necessary time. And through a tech grant from ISD, I wanna thank ISD, we will be receiving 23 new radios that will replace some of the older ones that did not get signal as well. And we will also be purchasing three new radios to be installed in our vehicles. Over the past several months, we have kick-started our Medi-Cal administrative activities claiming, which we believe can bring in substantial revenues for our county. This photo was taken by our probation team that attended a training in Los Angeles to help us refine our claiming efforts. The takeaway from my team was if LA can do it, so can we. At the probation department in LA, one division of 400 staff is bringing in approximately $4 million per year in MA or Medi-Cal administrative activities claiming. I wanna thank our health services director, Mimi Hall, and her staff for their technical assistant, assistance and investment in our department for expanding MA claiming. This past spring, the probation department was the lead applicant or partner in applying for and submitting three grant applications. And we are currently working on a fourth pretrial pilot program uh, with the courts. I wanna thank my team and partners for putting in the hard work to submit what I think were great proposals. I'm pleased to announce, and I think many of you know that on June 13th, the Board of State and Community Corrections awarded our county and the department two highly competitive grants, the Proposition 47 grant award of nearly $60 million for 3.7 years and the youth reinvestment grant for uh, $1 million for 3.7 years. 
these grants totaling nearly seven million dollars will have a significant impact for our justice involved individuals and also work to prevent young people from entering the juvenile justice system. But I do want to share with you that uh, grants are funded differently. Five, ten years ago, uh, we could fund five, six probation officers. Now, in some cases, a minimal of 50 percent, 60 percent, 70, even 90 percent of the dollars need to go to the community communities that we fund. So this really helps provide services, um, but it's not really funding probation positions, which would, would have been great. But we'll, we'll keep working on that. Take it away, Valerie. All right. <laughs> So I want to talk to you a little bit about what, uh, what is going on in our juvenile division. And in uh, this picture depicts in April, we hosted Mexico. Um, you will find that a work in our juvenile division is not constrained by borders. The excellent work of our staff and partners has been exported internationally. This, um, after we hosted the uh, delegation, we learned from them that they had a lot of great takeaways to go back and implement and practice there. And we're really proud of that. The delegation learned from our staff faculty and community partners that included the Watsonville PD, Community Action Board and Compass, Santa Cruz PD, and the County Office of Education. We are pleased to report that on July the 2nd, we will be honored to host Lisa Hamilton, who's the new president of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. She will be here in Santa Cruz to learn about our juvenile justice reforms. Thanks. In many ways, the trends and numbers and workload issues in the juvenile division and institution are opposite of what's going on in adult. And the juvenile services are referrals to probation, admissions to the juvenile hall, caseloads, and the number of youth sent to out-of-home placements has continued to decline, and we're proud of that. We've been a model site for two decades, a remarkable feat among all probation departments across the county, and our county should be proud of the fact that we have continued success and a power staff has stayed ahead of the curve and set trends for the nation. We've also helped change the course of juvenile justice in many jurisdictions. While we didn't have a grant open or ribbon cutting for our yet to be built juvenile hall <laughs> or renovations, we do have a lot to celebrate and it has to do with public safety, keeping kids uh, safely in their community and out of the juvenile justice system and more importantly, keeping them connected with their family, schools and communities. Risk-based supervision efforts have helped to realize our department's strategic uh, plan goal of effective supervision in the juvenile division. Goal 2.1 was to assess and cap caseload sizes to meet the best practice caseload ratios. We are able to give more attention to young people and help them stay safely in the community. The dramatic drop in juvenile crime and arrest rates has also allowed us to, spo to focus on specialized cases. It should be noted that in uh, December of 2017, there were 171 active clients on probation. And as can be seen by this graph, uh, there were 28 fewer youth being supervised on probation in 2018, which represents a 16% decrease. With declining numbers, uh, we've merged some caseloads and added an additional officer to help manage our child and family team meetings, which have greatly increased. And we believe we are right-sized in the juvenile division, and we're seeing the results because of that. We are well on our way to meeting our probation objective of number 165 of group homes by 2021. Probation will decrease the number of youth placed in short-term residential therapeutic programs, now known as STRTPs as a result of continuum of care reform. And that reduction is by 50% for juvenile justice involved youth. And as you can see, our new placement orders have reduced by 77% since 2015. We're very proud of that. Um, we are able to celebrate that fewer youth are sent to out-of-county group homes and far away from their loved ones. We are keeping youth closer to home, and this has a lot to do with our child and family team meetings, the alternative to out-of-home placement programs known as Fuerte. Uh, we sustain the program in partnership with Encompass and our partners at HSA. The child and family team meetings are really important because they've allowed the youth and families to have a stronger voice in the outcomes of their cases and more influence on supervision strategies. So they become partners in their own solutions and help to lead the way. Um, it's also created an opportunity for probation staff to look at options other than out of home placement, which is illustrated by the results that we have in keeping kids in the community. Our department uh, continues to stay ahead of the curve. Locally, we've already started envisioning our next steps and where we can make the greatest impacts in juvenile justice. 
This past year, we've begun to focus on prevention and education success for our South County students, and this has helped us start meeting Objective 166 of school outreach outlined in our operational plan. In this photo, we have probation staff, our partners from County Office of Education staff, and children's behavioral health staff who are supporting our project with um, youth in school. In 2018, the probation department, in partnership with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, came together to work on a pilot to enhance prevention opportunities for education success for students in South County. This pilot is a two-part project. It is social-emotional responses to student behaviors in order to support school retention and ensure uh, the assessment of needs and provide services and interventions accordingly. Um, the initial findings, we're proud to say, is determined that young people, after young people on probation were not earning high school credits or graduating at the rates of their peers in the county, uh, the first quarter of 2018-19 school year indicated a 143% increase in credits through this partnership uh, compared to the first quarter results from one year ago. In the third quarter, the increase of credit accruals was 20%, so we jumped to a 203% increase in credit accruals. So we found that by addressing the root causes of students' behaviors and absences and engaging parents, we're able to retain students in school and increase their academic achievement. So I would now ask you uh, to approve the proposed budget for the probation department, including any supplemental materials as recommended by the county administrative officer. Um, and this is the conclusion of my presentation, and I will take questions if there's time. <coughs> sure. Well, first I'll see if there's any public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us today on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, Good comments, book. and action. Uh, so, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the ongoing work that the department does uh, to help keep our community safe uh, and to uh, use really uh, good evidence-based practices uh, that we can see now have produced the results that, that we wanted in the, in the juvenile system in which there was an early investment and now um, uh, uh, with the adult system trying to work harder to make that uh, system work as well as possible. Uh, uh, I'm very curious about the pretrial uh, numbers and trying to get some sense of how many people in jail right now are there pre-trial? I think we're hovering at what the state average is, which is somewhere around 66% uh, in pre-trial. Um, and I know um, working with the sheriff to really make sure, drill down and make sure we're actually able to correctly and accurately identify that, that information. But so it's, it's either, uh, and with all the good efforts that we have with our pre-trial services, there's still a number of people in there uh, awaiting uh, sentencing, and, and we know we have a number of cases. Uh, some case, you know, they're in there three or four years, so that contributes to that. And uh, some of the other stuff that I'm I'm hoping that we'll look uh, look at more has to do with this pretrial pilot program grant through the Judicial Council, which the the court uh, is the primary applicant. We would partner with them, but that would really look at uh, and inform and tra help. I don't want to say train the judges, but uh, you know, and really inform the judges of, of pretrial and, and how that works and, and, and develop a little more confidence in that because as you know, there's probably 50, 53% concurrence rate with the rec release recommendations. So we'd like that to be higher. Sure. Uh, that means more folks could be released, but I think uh, we've got work to do on our end and, and we'll work with the courts. This grant would be a tremendous asset to our county. It could bring in anywhere from 1.4 million to 4 million. That's the, that's the amount that we qualify uh, for with our court. Yeah, well, I, I look forward to seeing if you can get that grant and the work with the judiciary. Uh, as we look at issues involving our jail facilities when we hear, when knowing that two thirds of the people haven't been convicted of everything, and that uh, with, uh, with uh, over a dozen years of uh, data on our pretrial program and the success that it has shown, knowing that the, you could still get the judges to only agree to 53% of the, uh, the uh, recommendations, to me there's a breakdown there. Um, it creates uh, a much, uh, it, it creates lots of problems in the jail uh, with the number of people that you have in there. Um, I'm not sure it makes us any safer. Uh, one could argue it makes us less safe. And 
uh, and we, uh, we're, we're, we're not working towards the rehabilitation necessary to, to ensure that we reduce recidivism. And it would be much wiser for us to invest in more pretrial probation staff, which is a lot less expensive than keeping someone in jail for two years before they stand trial. Um, that would pay for itself just one person. So uh, I think that that we have to do more work in uh, you know the sheriff's office, uh, the, the the your office, the CAO's office, the judiciary to figure out how we can increase those concurrence rates and reduce the number of people uh, in jail who haven't been convicted of anything. Um, and that uh, given the the many year history of 96 percent success rates where people show up for their um, uh, uh, court cases and don't commit crimes that are greater than the one that they were released on. The, the, we, we should have enough data to say um, that we could use a system that, that would have less impact um, on our county jail system, better impact in the community, um, and, uh, and if we have enough staff to be able to manage that program, because I see the, the increase, um, that that's a much wiser investment for us than figuring out how to build a bigger jail. Um, in regards to your operational uh, goals, I think they're very good because they're broad and they cover all the different things that you do. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, success that you've gotten with the, we call it the CAFES? Okay. CAFE, the, uh, the, the Prop 47 the, grant that's yeah. uh, coordinating. Yeah, well, we call it that yet or not, that, that way. The CAFES grant and the, and the, and the youth grant um, is fantastic. Your, uh, your department does a great job of bringing additional money into our county. And uh, while it's, it's unfortunate that more of it can't go to uh, a hiring probation staff, the community partners that you fund hopefully take some pressure off um, staff in the future uh, as we work to, to keep people out of the criminal justice system. Um, and I appreciate the work that you've done uh, to, as a, in a leadership position with the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force. Um, I think there's been great things that have come out of that. Um, the, the new Probation Service Center, hopefully will be renamed one day, but the, uh, uh, the Probation Service Center, it's, uh, I think that there are also some good opportunities there. And um, I'm kind of curious as to why only 10% do we think we'll use well, that? Well, we, we uh, looked at our um, overall I mean, do, uh, do other Do other uh, s uh, service centers like that in other communities see that kind of numbers? Le in a, so the the programs that we, that we visited uh, well, when you were developing this, you know, all said, when you open the doors, you're not going to get a stampede of people coming in. So it takes a little time and good advertising, you know, sure. uh, about the program. And maybe with a name change, that'd be more attractive. We'll see. <laughs> but um, so that's that was part of it. So we didn't want to set up our uh, set up our set up uh, ourselves up for failure. But 10% was 10% um, um, of our overall po probation population, which uh, I think today we have around 1,600 individuals on probation. So came to that number anywhere between you know 150 and 200 people coming into the service center. Yeah. Um, and we can adjust that, but I, but lessons learned from other programs that when you open the door, um, it, it's going to be a trickle, possibly, yeah. because okay. and I've had a lot of experience in op opening day treatment, evening center programs, and it, you have to advertise it, your partners to your core partners. Our judges are coming in doing a tour uh, in a couple weeks just for the judges, and a lot of other partners have scheduled that. So we're get building up business, opening the doors, and, and I hope we have a stampede. Obviously, that's what we want. All for free food, as it yes, usually yeah. brings them in. Uh, the, uh, I also appreciate your outreach to schools and that one of your goals is as targeting schools and uh, you recently participated or your staff recently participated in a outreach we did with North County Schools to talk about mental health issues, the role that it plays with criminal justice. You know, to, um, it becomes uh, incredibly important if we don't want someone to end up on your caseload. Uh, to do that work early on. So I think your outreach to schools is, uh, is uh, very warranted. Um, and th the last thing I'll just say is uh, I really appreciate the work in reducing the number of uh, kids placed in, um, in, in um, group homes outside the county. Right. I'm not, uh, I know that doesn't make them any better. Um, it really uh, breaks up the, the 
the things that, that uh, we know will make a difference in reducing recidivism, which is keeping them tied to a support network in their community, uh, keeping them connected to their family if possible, keeping them in school. And so any, as we do that work to keep on reducing that number um, is a worthwhile goal and will yield good public safety results. So I appreciate the work that, that you do every day and, and um, I wish you great success with the remaining grants that you have out there. Thank you, thank you uh, for the One support. last thing I'll just say is uh, I wanna uh, specifically acknowledge Sarah Fletcher for her participation in the Justice and Gender Task Force. Uh, and there have been other probation staff that have participated um, on that task force when we've looked at the, the, the criminal justice system, uh, but Sarah is, is there month after month and is a great participant and uh, provides a lot of great information, so thank you for that. And, and I wanna let you know that we're uh, incorporating a lot of what we've learned through that task force into our practices and even policies, and starting with our service center, there, we, we're developing a gender specific type of programming there, so it's been very helpful work and um, gone a long way. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Supervisor Pearson. Yeah, uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Uh, Drago, um, for your success and everybody in the staff. Um, it's really, truly impressive, and I can continue to be impressed by the uh, continuous improvements that you've made. And um, I remember going back to Philadelphia with some of your staff uh, to the Casey Foundation, a nationwide gathering that Santa Cruz County was at the center of how to get things done or how to do it. And very impressive, and you just have continued uh, your efforts in that regard. Um, it's somewhat um, phenomenal how many grants you get and you see, it's just seem to keep coming in. And I know that there are some restrictions on those that you just have received of almost $7 million, but um, that was a very competitive and I think it shows again how much uh, stature you hold uh, in the state and throughout this nation and, uh, and uh, addressing those who are in, uh, in need of probation um, support. Um, I think that um, I, I, you, to continue the objectives into next year is, is um, very impressive, but several objectives supporting youth in particular, uh, the young who have already offended and then who are at risk, and to divide those up and um, see how you can really uh, get to them and help them before they re, they re offend, number one, but don't offend in the first place, number two, but they're on that track. But um, I, I look forward to hearing um, more in your development of uh, appropriate facilities that could provide those better services and how we can coordinate our efforts with the uh, with what's in, in the jail and so forth. And um, I, uh, I think what you have done is um, outstanding to date and uh, just keep up the good work. Thank you, we'll, we will continue and we'll be sure to report back on the progress. These grants, it's uh, one thing to put them together and all the thought and work that goes into them, but the, I always tell staff, and as they know, the hard work begins when you've gotta implement them and sort of take right. that like movie script and turn it into the movie. Right. So we got a lot of hard work, but it's gonna be uh, very rewarding um, and beneficial. Thank you. Sure. Frank. How you doing? Doing very well, thank you. <laughs> How about you? Very well, thank you. All right. Yeah, I, uh, just a quick question. I don't think I ever asked you, but uh, when I saw the uh, you know equipment and everything that you yes. do need, um, it says uh, handcuffs. How, how often does, and when I say you, I mean your department, sure. how often do you have to actually use handcuffs? Um, fortunately, not very regularly, but we do. We make arrests. Sure. We have, we do, uh, uh, in the community, we have for, uh, folks who are um, out of compliance and, uh, or have a warrant status and they're agreeable um, to, um, to come and turn themselves in. So we, we do the arrest, put them in handcuffs put them in a caged vehicle and transport them to the jail, in some instances, juvenile hall. Um, we have youth who are on um, alternatives to detention program with strict you know, house arrests and they're out of compliance and we do affect arrests in those situations. So um, I don't know the statistics, but we, d we do make arrests and we do sure. use our you know, handcuffs, but it's, uh, uh, it's not a 50% you know, of the, the day yeah. you know, sp spent doing that, but, <sighs> but we do that. Now, if somebody is, uh violated their uh, probation, do you, uh, sometimes I guess you just tell them to turn themselves in? Well, there, there's, a, there's a continuum. We have to look at the severity of harm and the, the violation, really, sure. how that's 
impacting the community victims and uh, measure that against the need to put them in custody. So we have a continuum of responses. So it's a, it's a response grid to violations because they're all different in nature. Um, and so some responses which are severe enough, if there's uh, someone on a domestic violence caseload who has a stayaway order, however they're, <coughs> they're visiting that person or you know, stalking them, that's a severe violation and that person probably would need to be, go into custody. But there's other violations that uh, are not necessarily something that we would need to handle taking them to jail, but we can respond with appropriate interventions that would, uh, would support different behavior. So it's a continuum of responses from right. really not that severe to severe, but we have a matrix that helps us decide because we wanna be all our probation officers, we would like them to respond similarly to the same violations. I think what's interesting about uh, your uh, department and uh, probation officers and, and the whole, in a, as a whole, is uh, you actually, uh, you know your client, I guess, and but you also know their families, you know their history. It's a very personal job. Uh, and thank you for acknowledging that. I think that's uh, really, a story that uh, needs to be shared and heard that uh, we, we're with these clients uh, for, for a long time. You know, you have a, the point of arrest, point of going to jail, prosecution, and most frequently probation. That's a common, commonly used sentencing. And then we have them for three years, five years, uh, or more in some cases. And so we get to know them and everybody in that family and, su and support. So we, some ways be, we become part of the family and, and you'd be surprised that when our probationers have uh, life changes, children, they come to us first to tell us all the good news because we become, we've been that really consistent role, role model and figure and presence in their lives. So uh, it's just my, my staff, uh, it's, if you could spend some time with them and see what they do day in and day out, it's incredible. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, I have one more question. The recidivism rate, I, I think it's lower than the state or national average, and just briefly. Uh, yeah, we, we, well, last year um, in uh, 2018, we completed a recidivism, stu recidivism study of our AB 109 population. In our, for instance, our two-year recidivism rate when compared to 12 other counties, and this is using the same methodology, and the state definition of recidivism was 39% at, 37% uh, at two years, and at three years it was 47%. Um, and so, of course, that means people did reoffend and uh, recidivated. Most of those uh, were misdemeanors, so um, one of our goals is, is to really um, put in a process where we can e annually remeasure that using the same uh, measures that we have in place. So, um, and coincidentally, just today, um, a, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California, I think it's PPIC, released a report. Uh, I haven't, I just looked at the summary initially and it talks about recidivism rate. We're not included in that study, but it, um, something everyone's interested in. But I do wanna share the recidivism is, is one way to measure success and it's important, but there's a lot of other things that we also wanna look at um, in terms of client, client success as well. But we're working hard to, to keep, you know, obviously measuring recidivism. All right. Uh, so thank you for your uh, presentation today and for your work year round. We've opened and uh, <coughs> closed public comment. So now it's time for a motion. Uh, motion second. by McPherson. Second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our final presentation of the day. This is page, uh, or item number 49. Uh, consider the 2019 proposed budgets for the Sheriff Coroner as uh, outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the continuing agreements list items for final approval on last day of budget hearings on June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the Sheriff Coroner. Good morning, Chair, Community Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. And I just wanna start out by letting you know who's here today, our, our Administrative Services Manager, Kathy Sams, is seated next to me. She's, she and her team work daily in our budget, and she's the most intimate with it. And then uh, my Law Enforcement Chief, Mitch Medina, is here. Uh, my Corrections Chief, Jeremy Vrinsky, and then also my Undersheriff, 
Craig Wilson is here as well. And so before I get started on my comments, I do want to acknowledge uh, the work that we do with the CAO's office and Carlos Palacios and our, our analyst, Melody Serrano. And uh, I just really appreciate the relationship that we have and the ability to negotiate some of these tough budgets and, and get things figured out. And uh, I, I really appreciate the way that we work together. So thank you to them. Today, I want to talk to you about a few things. Uh, I want to talk to you about our cri crime rates. I want to, we're going to talk a little bit about accomplishments, a budget overview, and then some uh, highlights in the 19 to 21 budget, as well as how our uh, budget aligns with the strategic plan for the county. So obviously, law enforcement and fire is a very expensive endeavor, and it's something the taxpayers pay a lot of money uh, for. And when you're running a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week operation, we cost four times what a normal county department is going to cost because we have to have that many personnel covering uh, a, a large geographical area. And so I just want to give you an idea of what some of the return for dollars is on this. And the first slide I want to share with you is our crime rates. And I, I was looking back at annual reports dating back to the 70s that were written by Al Noren's administration. And the crime rate in Santa Cruz County in 1975 was 52 crimes per 1,000 people. 52 crimes per 1,000 people. And those are the good old days that people want. They pine for the good old days, right? <laughs> I grew up here. People want, you know, back then they could let their kids roam free and, and do all these things. But there was 52 crimes per 1,000 people in Santa Cruz County in the unincorporated area. And so when you look at this chart, you can see before prison realignment, we were sitting at about 27 crimes per 1,000 residents. And then after realignment, it declined by a third down to about 17, and it's remained relatively flat. It ticked up a little bit after Prop 47 hit, but it's flattened out to about 15, 16 crimes per 1,000 residents, and that's both property crime and violent crime. Moving on to our homicide rates, as you guys, you guys have all been around a long time, uh, in the 70s, Santa Cruz was known as the murder capital of America. Uh, we move into the 80s. You can see that uh, in this chart are homicides in unincorporated Santa Cruz County, not counting the cities. This is unincorporated Santa Cruz County. And from 84 to 88, we had 51 killings in that five-year period. That is a lot of homicides for a county our size for about, well, now it's 140,000 residents. Back then, I think it was less than 100,000 residents. And then it dropped down to the next five-year period was 30, and then it leveled out over the next 20 years to about an average of about 18 homicides for every five years. And then you can see from 2014 to 2018, we've dropped down to four. That's a remarkable number. And you're talking about a 90% reduction in homicides from the 80s to where we're at present day. And moving on to the next, oops, we didn't get that in there. Uh, there, there's another slide that I wanted to share with you that I'll just, I'll just briefly mention is that our overall crime rate is half of the average of the state of California. State of California overall crime rate is at 30 and we're at 15. And so I, I think these are numbers that we should be really happy with. We certainly haven't eradicated crime in Santa Cruz County, but we're doing pretty well. And it's really hard to determine what's causing this lowering of the crime, whether it's, there's been so many legislative and voter approved initiatives over the last 10 years between prison realignment, Prop 47, Prop 57, Prop 64, and then a bunch of legislative changes. It's hard to put your finger on what's, on what's making this decline, but we're seeing it on the juvenile side and we're seeing it on the adult side. And so since we can't really pinpoint, I'm just gonna claim that it's outstanding work by the sheriff's office. <laughs> Uh, as far as this is, I have it on a disc. Would you like to? Yeah, this is out yeah, of. This is that. We didn't load the right one. <clears throat> okay. Well, we will just stick with this, Kathy. It's fine. So, as far as some accomplishments in uh, 1819, it's already been mentioned that we located the or opened the Aptos Public Safety Center, which is a joint venture with District Attorney, Probation, and Supervisor Friend, and that that was a. It's going to be. It's, it's really a great location. It's in the heart of Aptos, and I think it's going to be a, of great service to the Aptos community. Uh, further accomplishments in 1819, we continue to provide two 24-hour sessions a year to Sheriff's Office employees, as well as all law enforcement in Santa Cruz County for crisis intervention team training. And we have about 60% of our corrections and operations staff is now trained in crisis intervention team training. and. Uh, 
with the amount of mental health calls for service that we're experiencing right now, somewhere between eight or 10 a day for people in serious mental health crisis, just in the county, not counting the cities, uh, this training has pro pro proved to be very beneficial for our staff and for the community. Uh, we're also uh, providing ICAT training, which is the Integrated Communications Assessment and Tactics Training, and, and what this training talks about, and it's, we, we've done five or six 10-hour blocks of this for our patrol staff, and what this training talks about is how to deal with somebody who has a weapon that's not a gun and bring that case to a successful resolution. And we're, we're seeing these cases over and over and over in patrol. Baseball bats, knives, swords, axes, rocks that our people are being confronted with and we have to figure out ways using time, distance, cover, communication skills to successfully resolve those cases and we are. We've also implemented body-worn cameras and corrections, so now every frontline staff member, whether you're working in patrol or you're working in our jails, is wearing a body-worn camera. And there's very specific rules on how that camera is used and how that evidence is stored and, and how long it's stored. But we're doing somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 6,000 video segments a month right now. And during critical cases, whether they're, they're occurring in the jail or out in the community, that body-worn camera evidence is, is telling us a lot about what happened on that particular call. We've also uh, our, uh, have started our focused intervention team, which is funded with Measure G dollars that, that was passed in the November election for the half-cent sales tax. And uh, that team is doing quite well. There's been a lot of early successes. They're, they're running a full caseload. We have three personnel from the sheriff's office on it. We're also partnering with County Mental Health and they're providing three of their personnel. And we're out in the community dealing with high volume call, uh, high volume users of the judicial system and people who just uh, w refuse to get treatment. And, and so far that team's going well. We've also embedded a manager and two detectives into the cannabis compliance unit. And there's been a number of cases that have been publicized locally about what this team is doing. And they're really going after the bad actors and the people that are causing environmental damages, the people that are laundering money, the people that are shipping large quantities of marijuana to other states, uh, as well as the people who have firearms. And we've located a lot of firearms uh, during some of these illegal grow operations that our people are coming across. Uh, we've also increased medical services at Roundtree. We uh, opened up the rehabilitation and reentry facility uh, last year. And now we have 150 men on that campus, and so there was a need to expand medical coverage, and we were able to do that in the 18-19 budget. And then we're, we're at the end of about year two of, of a four-year process to get our lab certified to process DNA evidence. And this has a, a, a lot of value to lo the local justice system. I, I think I mentioned to you last year, but it takes the Department of Justice on a priority case, say a, a sexual assault case or a homicide case, about eight to 12 weeks to get a return on DNA evidence. And with our own lab, we'll be able to turn that evidence around in about two days. And that's gonna, that's gonna get the, the violator off the street quicker, it's gonna bring closure to the survivor of that crime, and it's gonna provide better evidence to the courts and for the district attorney. And so in this current budget cycle, we were able to create a lab director position, which was filled, and then uh, behind that, we were able to uh, get a lab manager position filled. And then I'll talk about it in a moment uh, as far as what we're doing moving forward with some more personnel. And then we're in the accreditation process for our coroner's division through the International Association of Coroners and Medical Examiners, and, and our coroner's unit will be accredited within the next six to 12 months. Uh, just a brief budget overview. Uh, you can see our revenues are up uh, as our expenditures, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And our, our total funded staffing allocation for uh, 1920 is going to be about 358 employees. So our revenues uh, primarily through uh, 172 money as well as, uh, as, pro as uh, AB 109 dollars is coming in around 31 million dollars this year. Our total expenditure is about 85 million. Uh, the 1920 budget calls for a status quo in, in most of the other areas including overtime training, services and supplies. We are asking for a few items to increase security, particularly around drug use and smuggling into our jail system. And I, I do wanna provide you some photos just from a case that had occurred two days ago. Thank you. And so drugs are coming in, into our facilities three ways. They're coming in at intake. So somebody is brought into the main jail 
by an arresting agency. It could be any of the police departments, it could be the probation department. But somebody's arrested, they come into our facilities and they have drugs concealed in a body cavity. And the photographs that you're looking at, or the photograph that you're looking at, uh, there was two ounces of heroin and methamphetamine, marijuana, tobacco, and hypodermic syringes that were taken from a person's body cavity two days ago. Those drugs would have eventually made it into our general housing unit. Uh, we had a, a, a person bring in two ounces of methamphetamine about a month and a half ago, and it caused multiple overdoses. It caused one woman to have open heart surgery because uh, she used a lot of it and uh, those medical expenses are all being paid by us as taxpayers. So we really have to work on increasing our security around drug abuse inside our jails. And so the, uh, besides intake, drugs are coming in through the mail, and that's a very small amount of drugs, and then they're coming in through contact visits. We have contact visits at our Roundtree facility and at the Blaine Street facility. And so we could easily say, okay, we've got a drug problem, we're just gonna end contact visits, but that's not, that's not the, what's best the, or the right thing to do. We have to allow uh, our, our lower level uh, incarcerated people to have contact visits with their children and loved ones. So um, with that, uh, to, to combat the intake challenge that we're having, we're, we're gonna lease a body scanner, and they're in many California prisons and county jails and it's much like what you see at the airport. And so when somebody comes into the main jail and, and they're gonna go through the intake process, they're gonna walk through this body scanner. And we have a, a very strict draft policy on data storage, who has the right to view that information, uh, and, as well as when that body scanner will be used. Uh, but we believe that that's gonna prevent a lot of the drugs coming in uh, at intake. This budget also calls for the hiring of an additional correctional officer and a canine which will be a Labrador uh, drug sniffing dog. We already have one of those uh, in our patrol team. It's very effective. And so during contact visits and also uh, uh, that animal would be used on cell searches and some other things. Um, but I, I believe just the presence of having a dog at the uh, family visits will deter people from even trying to bring drugs in, into the jail system. And so we're looking at this as, as a three-pronged approach. The mail, each item of mail gets searched and gone through, but, but these folks are clever and they have ways of getting it in. So, um, but that, that's where we're gonna be upgrading our, uh, some of our security, our correctional facilities. Uh, we're also, uh, this budget asked to bring on a, an additional sexual assault detective to uh, work on inmate-related uh, sexual assaults that are, are reported in our jail system. As far as continued progress with DNA certification, uh, this budget is asking to fund two DNA criminalists mid-year, and those DNA criminalists will help us start establishing some of the protocols and procedures and continue our certification process. They will also begin working on prepping DNA samples that, sent to, to get sent to DOJ that will, uh, that will improve the time, uh, the turnaround time from the Department of Justice. Uh, Currently, as far as in, inmate dental goes, we only provide dental services at the main jail, so if there's somebody at Roundtree who needs dental services, we have to transport that person down to the main jail, and so we're gonna be, or we're asking to expand dental services out to the Roundtree facility. We're in year two of a complete replacement on our handheld radios. Those, those radios have aged out, and the radio shop is no longer able to work on them, and so we're gonna be completing the replacement of those. And then uh, something you don't really think about, but when you're, when you're cooking or, or producing 2,000 meals a day in, inside our jail facilities, uh, we have industrial kitchens at two locations and industrial equipment, and some of this equipment is over 30 years old and it needs replacement, so this budget is calling uh, to replace some of the, the items that need, that need to be replaced. As far as uh, is how our uh, operational goals align with the county strategic plan. Um, where did that go? Okay, I don't have that. So the, un under operational ex excellence, we are working with the CAO's office and the probation department about trying to identify existing facilities and, and, and 
uh, assets that the county owns that, that we could uh, use in creating a all women's jail facility. And I think this is something that the county's gonna have to address at some point, whether it's this year, five years from now, or 10 years from now, it's gonna have to be addressed. We currently house, have two women's housing units in what's essentially an all male jail. And uh, there's a lot of operational things that can go wrong <laughs> with that. And so uh, the best practice is, is to have a women's facility that, that women go to from, from intake to booking to pretrial, to post adjudication, to release. And so that's, uh, th that's an area that we're gonna be examining, see if there's some things that we can do on that and, and to, to examine what sort of uh, financing we can find for something like that. Uh, we're, we're also looking at increasing our uh, medical services uh, and then what we talked about, the DNA and the, the coroner's piece. As far as comprehensive health and safety goals, uh, the Sheriff's Office is always partnering with local communities. We have seven substations throughout the county. Uh, we, we have to invest in our facilities and, and our main jail uh, is really at a point where it's aging out. It, it is, it's at the end of life and so it, it takes a lot of money, time and effort to keep that facility going. And then of course invest, investing in our own employee safety equipment to reduce injuries is always a priority and our staff is gonna be, or at least a part of our staff is gonna be going to a, a different type of uniform this year that's a carrier that takes a lot of the weight off backs because we do suffer a lot of back injuries uh, due to, due to uh, the, the duty belt weighing about 20 pounds and, and the constant wear and tear on our people's backs. So we're gonna transfer some of that weight to the shoulders and, and we'll be a purchasing, uh, purchasing equipment for that. So that's, those are the items that I wanted to talk about and, and I'm asking that the board approve this proposed budget for the Sheriff's Office, including all supplemental material as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. And I'm happy to answer any questions or listen to comments you might have. Okay, uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the ongoing work of you and all the staff and the Sheriff's Office. Uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have an office uh, at, the, at the Sheriff Administration building. I get to see a lot of activity that goes on there, people being uh, there, people coming in and getting help and, uh, and the trainings that go on uh, on a regular basis uh, and just the ongoing day-to-day -day work. So it's very impressive. Um, and uh, I, the operational goals that you have, I think are, are, are good. Um, you and I have talked about the facilities and I hope that we'll take advantage of things like either the, the task force on justice and gender or the jail overcrowding task force or some other things to take a look at the issues that you bring up around facilities because I think they're really important. Um, and I hope you'll, you'd also be willing to participate in the discussion that I brought up with um, uh, Ms. Geraldo about uh, trying to figure out whether there are people that we're holding um, in our jails who don't necessarily need to be there and would uh, uh, help relieve some of the capacity issues um, that are in uh, our county jails right now. Um, in regards to uh, the, one of the goals around the DNA laboratory, um, I'm wondering whether it's gonna help us, one of, the, uh, one of the concerns that is regularly brought up to me is what's going on with our SART program and that people have to go outside the county and um, do we have a, uh, uh, it, will this help us bring that, all that work back here? Well, I'll, uh, Under Sheriff Wilson has been assigned to, uh, on, on the SART piece of it, so if I could have him just sure. say a few comments about where we're at with that. We are in a transition period where they will be coming back over. Uh, the, the DNA lab will certainly expedite cases where we're not sure if uh, uh, who the suspect is or if there's some question as to who the suspect is because we'll be, if we do, are able to collect DNA evidence during a SART exam, we'll be able to process that very okay. rapidly. But if, if the undersheriff could comment on where we're at with that. Good afternoon, Craig Wilson. Uh, we're very interested in getting the SART uh, program for adults returned back to Santa Cruz County. Uh, we've been in discussions with Valley Medical Center that operates a, a program there um, for almost uh, about 18 months now. Uh, and we're at a point where we believe that the, in the, during the fall of this year, that adult services will return to Santa Cruz County through our partner Dominican, on site at Dominican. Um, and we've been working through some uh, MOUs and agreements to, to bring this to fruition. So 
with any luck, uh, by the end of the year, we'll be back in service. That'd be great. I mean, I, I, th I think people are very sensitive to the fact that, uh, um, that uh, women who have gone through this uh, um, violation have, have got to go outside the county to get services. I know you care about it. You've, uh, you, to uh, you told me about it, and it's great to see those plans um, uh, reaching fruition to have it back here in Santa Cruz County. So thank you for your work there. Um, the other thing I wanted to just talk to you about, it's not part of your budget, but I know that you have uh, both been helpful in the community and been a leader in the state on issues involving immigrants. Um, when, when in February 2017, when there was a raids and there was a lot of concern in the community, you were right there uh, sending an important message to all members of the community that you, that you don't look at the job of the sheriff's department to do immigration. Um, and I know you, your support in SB 54 was also um, an uh, incredible leadership position. And the, uh, you know, the president tweeted uh, just a couple days ago that they're gonna try to arrest millions of people. And I'm wondering from the perspective of the work that you do, um, is there anything that we should be doing um, or supporting you in doing uh, when it comes to that kind of threat that's out there in the community? Well, I, I can say this. I, uh, despite the national rhetoric, I, I, uh, I believe m that all the county chiefs, because I meet with them monthly, as well as myself, are committed to holding on to the same position that we've been holding on to for a couple years now, and that is that, that, that local law enforcement will not entangle themselves with immigration services. And so, of course, we can't prevent them from coming into our jurisdictions and, and do whatever it is that they do. Uh, in some regards, uh, I, I believe it's good to have somebody there to, so that at the, a loc at the local level we can observe what's going on, but, but we've made some promises that we will stay away from that. And, and so uh, w w there, there will be no change in a local law enforcement's response. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't have any great ideas on, on what, el what other things we can do to, uh, to prevent any problems here. I, I, I did get some word out through the news, I believe it was yesterday, uh, because there was some, some fear in the community after hearing the president talk like that, and so I, I, I was able to get on, on a couple of local TV stations to try to reassure the community that we were not gonna be participating nor were any of the local uh, police departments. Well, I appreciate that constant um, uh, efforts to, to share that message, and I think the, the continued partnering with the community so people see uh, the sheriff's department as their partner rather than their their adversary I think goes a long way in terms of building community and let everybody know in the community that they're going to be represented and protected uh, by the sheriff's uh, office. Thank you for your work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Supervisor Professor. Yeah, I just want to thank you and um, your team leadership and, and everybody in the department for your uh, continuing service to provide public safety. Uh, I think the most important uh, charge that we have as county supervisors or on any level of government. Um, and I know that I've thanked you time and again, but I can't thank you. I want to thank you once more for opening the service centers in the 5th District in uh, Felton and Boulder Creek. It has been so well received. People feel so much better. And I think it has, uh, you know, the, and the deputies and the volunteers who staff that center too, so welcoming. The, and I want to thank them, the volunteers as, as well. And I think um, you were talking about the crime rate going down. I think that part of it might be just the visibility per se that you're there in the communities and people think, well, you know, maybe this is, uh, they'll take um, five minutes and not five hours to get up here to, uh, to do something to uh, respond. But I think uh, in the patrol, I'm not sure if I have the numbers right, but you're in the high 50s now and in the recession period, it was in the high 30s, high 30s or 30s. Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and it's really interesting. Of we, We've opened a lot of substations to, over the years, and the, I've received the most positive feedback about the Boulder Creek substation. The, the folks yeah. up there are just so pleased with, with having that local presence. It's been a real good relationship with that community. Yeah, it's been, thank you very much. And um, I think similar to my comments uh, on the facilities for youth offenders, the facilities we use to incarcerate adults, uh, both women and men, um, we really need to review that because I think what the jail has just uh, 300 and 
19 beds or something, and you've, you've got a population of almost 600 or something at times, don't you, over there? Yeah, so well, there's 319 beds in there, and we have, uh, today we have about 380. Uh, last week we had about 420 people in there, so we were about 25% uh, over, over capacity. Yeah. Well, it's, it's something I'm, I know that you were gonna take a look at, and I, I really do uh, appreciate that. And I, I really, uh, as I've said with some other departments here too, the dialogue, the sheriff, the, ch uh, the chief probation officer, who's still here to make sure he hears what you have to say, I guess. But uh, that uh, you're just having, you know, really the, the best use of our facilities. And um, you know, there's uh, the juvenile hall, maybe it's not being used quite as much. I think that just a review of this whole situation needs to be, I know it's going to be reviewed, but I think it's time to do so. But thank you for everything and everybody in your office. Great, thank you. Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Uh, I asked uh, the DA already, so pretty much do you, do you agree with the response that he had when your balancing act that you have to do with uh, maybe cooperating with ICE or uh, or, or not? You know, there, you, you have such a tough job when it comes to that because if you turn a blind eye and then that person that they're looking for, you know, commits a big crime. And then of course, uh, the other side would be uh, all the innocent people that are uh, drawn into all the drama uh, of somebody being uh, uh, pursued by ICE. Yeah. Yeah, and, and really, when somebody comes in on serious charges, uh, ultimately, they're gonna get deported at the state level, right? They're gonna go to state prison eventually, and then ICE will pick them up once they serve their sentence. And so, you know, could, some, could a serious offender slip through the gap somehow, possibly, but really, uh, I think we have a pretty solid system in place here in Santa Cruz County to prevent that from occurring. Sure. And then uh, the with the jail population and anything that goes wrong, you're under, uh, a lot of scrutiny from a lot of people and you know uh, um, yeah, how difficult is that for you to you know have to deal with uh, because you're, you're talking about how, how many uh, inmates were you saying today system-wide with all four facilities we're at about 550 inmates. I know. and yeah. so we're we're way over capacity our, our staff we don't get to staff up when we have a hundred people over we still have the same staffing levels and so we're, we're asking uh, much more of them. They're a bit, they've been on mandatory overtime for two years, so they're working a lot of shifts. And so, uh, you know, it, it's a challenge. And what, what I've found now, I, this is my fifth year as being the sheriff, is that we really have very little control as to who comes and goes out of that jail. It's really a function of the courts and the district attorney and the public defender and the probation department and parole. Uh, we get orders to hold somebody and we hold them. If, if we can release them on electronic monitoring or through Sheriff's OR, we do that. Uh, but it's really, there's, when, when it takes five years for a homicide case to go to trial, and we have, right now, we have 20% of our populations in pretrial two years or more, and there's this huge stopgap in the corp system, and there's, there's continuance after continuance after continuance. Uh, it, 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 that trickles down to us where we're feeling the impact of, of, of the slow processes in the judicial system, but we're feeling it. Uh, severely in the in the jail. You bet. And then with the uh, 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 mental health uh, training, how, how's that going? The, on the crisis intervention yeah. team training, it's going great. It's a it's a really solid program. It's something that we partner with County Mental Health on to develop a 24-hour course uh, course that is uh, certified by the Police Officer Standard and Training, which is the state commission that oversees all police. So it's a certified course. And uh, I, I think our people are learning a lot. And we're, they're, what they're learning about is when they see behaviors by somebody who's experienced a mental illness, they're learning how to, how to interpret that behavior on what it really means. And so it's rather than perceived, it's okay, that, you know, I, I just, I, I know what that person is doing, I know why they're doing it. And I think it's uh, reducing use of force cases, it's, and it's reducing uh, errors that could be made during high stress situations. You bet. Yeah, that adds, uh, you know, now you're, uh, you're more like, uh, you're lo you have such a uh, varied job. Uh, you have to be uh, tough in certain situations and then in other situations you might be able to be like a counselor and that's really rough. And then uh, you throw in uh, body cameras. Uh, 
with uh, body cameras, uh, is it making your job uh, more difficult? Because with that, it's, uh, it's kind of, in a way, it's good for both sides uh, when there's a disagreement, but uh, there's no room for oops. I made a mistake, well, I guess, with the body camera. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think everybody behaves better when they're on camera. And so I, I, I think we're seeing that. And if a mistake's made, we acknowledge it, learn from it, and move on. Um, but the, the body-worn camera gives people like myself, it gives police administrators the, a, a really good idea of what's going on on some of these cases, cases that que get questioned by the community. And uh, I can't think of any other job that we ask an employee to put a camera on and film everything that you do. I agree. It's, it's a very unique uh, position to be in, and yet our staff embraced it, and they wanted those cameras, because they, they see those cameras as protecting them because we're so spread out. We're covering 450 square miles, so like right now we have one deputy on duty for every 50 square miles of this county. And so a lot of the contacts and a lot of the interactions they have is one-on-one. -on -one. And so then we get complaints and it's this, he said, he said, he said, she said, well, the camera answers a, a lot of those questions now that, and that really protect our staff and shows exactly what occurred. Yeah, uh, you, you don't have to have them on, uh, like when you're going to get a break or having a cup of coffee. That's correct, we do not turn those That's on. That's good, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, just very briefly, um, <clears throat> I'm dismayed to hear that people are more grateful in Boulder Creek than they are in Davenport, because uh, <laughs> they're really grateful in Davenport uh, and the North Coast for the, uh, for, the, for the deputy up there. It's made a big difference on both some pretty significant crime and then just sort of uh, quality of life, uh, low level crime that's going on up there. So uh, appreciate the efforts and the proactive efforts especially to coordinate with other agencies and try to be a presence up there. Um, and then the fit, I just wanna uh, appreciate both the voters, you and county uh, health for the fit team. Um, we had a population of people that were just falling through the cracks over and over and over again and having a disproportionate impact on our community. They're the most challenging population to work with and, um, and I think we're seeing some initial good results and I look forward to working with you. And because this is new and because this is a, uh, a uniquely challenging population, don't hesitate to let us know how we can help, assist, where are other resources that would make a difference um, in, in the efforts that, that we can do because it's, it's just an important one because it's one that just drives people crazy, it has huge community impacts and people are really suffering. It does, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to, to, to looking at the ASR review and, and, and the report that they'll generate that might call out some strengths or weaknesses or some areas where we can make some adjustments. So I, um, I, I think we are, are in about year, or excuse me, month five of, of, of the FIT team, so I think once a little time passes by and we can evaluate data and, and really figure out what it is that's working or, or not working. Okay, great. Um, now's the time for public comment. I don't know if the probation staff wants to come up and comment on uh, the sheriff's budget. <laughs> All good, okay. Uh, anyone else would like to comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for uh, action. Uh, motion by McPherson, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. And thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you to the deputies. Uh, we will now uh, recess to our continued budget hearings at 1.30 on Tuesday, June 25th uh, for our last day budget hearings and then and before that we'll have a 9 a.m. Board of Supervisors meeting uh, which will be our regular meeting on June 25th here at 9 a.m. In the, in, the, in the county chambers.